with the website and and with uh, social media have exploded. This last year, you know, has been the the doom of the of the pandemic, though, has led to quite a renaissance. It seems like in people being at home and observing and so on. So it's been huge um, for the for the brand. Right, yeah. that's great news, Dave. This year, yeah. And I think Scott, you've had the same sort of um, experience. Everybody, everybody in our industry. Yeah. You know, if you were involved in amateur astronomy in some way, you know, whether you're building gear or doing services or, you know, print, uh, you know, anything to do with uh, supporting the astronomical amateur astronomical community, it's been really building and building strong. You know, so mm -hmm. I think it, I think we're going to see something. Uh, that we haven't seen in a long time. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, it's all good. It's all good. And it's getting exciting too, because we're getting closer and closer towards uh, people getting their vaccinations mm -hmm. and, you know, um, so that's, uh, that's awesome because we're, we're going to be able to get out eventually uh, to our star parties and all of that. But I think all the stuff we learned about um, connecting with other people around the world, you know, it, I think that's going to continue on. I, I, I definitely will continue doing global star party, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, I plan to, as I go to events, um, you know, I, you know, I always ask, you know, well, if we go to your event, can I broadcast live? And they're like, sure, you know, you can do that. So I think that because you meet some amazing people at the events too, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's nice to, you know, whether you're, you know, able to interview lecturers or just uh, people that are going to their first event ever, you know, that kind of thing. It's always really interesting. So. But Scott, I was going to say, I, I remember this young writer in Astronomy Magazine that was writing articles on deep sky objects. Oh, that guy. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever became of him. <laughs> He's the editor. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> that was a long time ago, long. it seems like. <laughs> long, 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 long. Lifetimes ago. Yeah. You could say last century. Oh, yeah. right. <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. I, I yeah. think it was we got it right David, here on our our program. It's awesome. Her, I love it. I think it was very on very early on. It was it was Dr. David Levy who who met this dumb kid from Ohio, you know, and took pity uh. and started writing. <laughs> well, actually, I um, didn't really take pity on him, but I just started. We started to talk and we started to joke around a little bit, and we helped the. Uh, County or the city of Milwaukee explode of an expressway <laughs> right outside the offices of Astronomy Magazine. That that's a story that need that's a story that needs to be told, David, at, at some point and written up. The, the yeah. it was the 1984 Astronomical League convention was in Waukesha of all places, near where I am now, well, a little distance west of Milwaukee. And uh, the, the league was there, our friends, you know, from Sky and Tell were there, of course. And if you've ever seen the movie, The Blues Brothers, there's a famous chase on a freeway where the car goes off the end of, a, of an unfinished freeway. Well, that was a freeway that actually existed in Milwaukee. And, uh, and then the car comes down in Chicago in the movie. Well, they never finished this freeway downtown in Milwaukee. And so they decided to detonate it. And they did oh, wow. it on the weekend when the Astronomical League meeting was going on. David was there with me at Astronomy Magazine's headquarters and they exploded this thing and dropped a freeway down a whole story with dynamite. And it shattered the front windows of the Astro Media building it was at the time. Um, which was a couple blocks away. They were, it was all, it was a glass, what had been a law office of the founder, Steve Walther's brother was the lawyer. Um, so it was put into that building. So the, the joke for that weekend, of course, was that Sky and Tell had dispatched some agents to the astronomy headquarters there. <laughs> I will never forget that story, David. 
that'll be with me as long until I've gone to have died and gone it, to heaven. It was a pretty impressive explosion, wasn't it? <laughs> it really was. And I think it cemented our friendship. <laughs> and uh, yeah. friendship, the we and I send our love to Linda. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We send our love to Linda and uh, hope all's well. Linda got her first shot today. She is a teacher, hey, so great. she is underway. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Great. All right. We got our Congratulations. Shot awesome. That's good news. <clears throat> and uh, at the end of the month, we're going to go partying. Yeah. Uh huh. Awesome. Yeah, the CDC guidelines are looking really good. So as long yeah. as uh, everyone's vaccinated, it's time to get together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, it, about 10% of the population has been, been vaccinated, but they're yep. hoping to, um, you know, keep vaccinating and it's, it's improving the situation, but they, they'll st they're still recommending that you try to maintain distance and uh, and wear masks whenever app applicable. It's a but good, good recommendation. Yeah. Yep, mm -hmm. they're on the cautious side. But we may be uh, only months away from a partial restoration of, of normality, at least now. I think so. Yes. They're, they're hoping by summer uh, yeah. that things will get better. But it's yep. just, uh, you know, we'll keep, keep going. And the more the more people in the population get vaccinated, and, and it should uh, improve the situation for everyone to sure. be able to open their businesses and uh, restaurants and stuff like that. Let's just hope the number of uh, anti-vaxxers who uh, would rather listen to teenage movie stars than epidemiologists is not in the hundred in, in the tens of millions here. Yeah. Well, we're still, we'll just, yeah, hopefully they won't, but we'll have to wait. Yeah. There, there's still a long way to go to, to sort of uh, get everyone on the board of understanding what, what science is all about here in this civilization. And I think that uh, our group can actually go some way towards helping with that problem. Absolutely. Yep. We need people like Libby to help us with that problem. Yes. You betcha. Well, people like Libby are the future. That's that's what we need. And by, you know, I'm, I'm sorry that she and everyone else has gone through this, but it's a good learning experience for her and, you know, in the future. So we just have to wait and see what happens. But yeah. Her grandkids will be asking her about this, you know. About this Actually, time. Actually, I was wondering if there was anybody from Astronomy Magazine who might be interested in asking Libby to write an article for them. Yeah. Yes. I don't, I don't see anybody here who could do that. A for ab somebody. Absolutely. Yes. We, sh we should talk about that, Libby, sometime. Is, she, is Libby here still? Yeah, I'd love she to. She just passed out. She's Would Libby be interested in, in writing a story about popularizing astronomy sometime? Yeah, definitely. Well, we'll have to chat about that. I can, uh, I know the people there pretty well, or at least I can bribe them into uh, getting our way with yeah. the astronomy magazine. People. <laughs> right. So, That's so pretty does, cool. Does Libby have a fan club? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember I, I started astronomy more or less when, when Libby did, about her age. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How old are you again, Libby? I just turned 11 in December, so. Wow, congratulations. That's awesome. Great. You're on a great journey. Mm -hmm. yeah. And as you know already, Libby, this is a golden age to be interested in this stuff. We've never seen this kind of research, scientific results, exploration. This is the best time by far ever to, to get into this yeah. stuff. And For because all of humanity, that's true. Absolutely. The, the, the rate of discovery, of knowledge, of expansion of what we know is uh, much, much greater than it was a generation ago now. Oh, yeah. Also, the ability and the access to information and technology. I mean, you're starting at a great age, Libby. I mean, my daughter is 16, and uh, the stuff that she's doing now compared to when I was her age and your age, it's just amazing. Yeah. And I'm just talking about the range of telescopes and gears 
she has to able to to get mm. I, and my time when I was Libby's age there was just one telescope or binoculars you get get and start with yeah. and in these my, days yeah. Yeah. yeah go in, ahead in my in my time an eight and ten, eight to ten inch telescope was a big a big scope then a big scope. You remember when an eight to ten or a twelve inch scope eight was a cl huge. astronomy club oh, had a telescope, <laughs> yeah, like that. But but not too many individuals thirty years ago. Yeah, yeah. the four four inch was considered small, uh, or or and then uh, and then the a six inch was medium, and an eight inch was large. <laughs> yeah, this is what I started with my astronomy. Oh. All right, oh, nice. It's, it's an uh, pirate scope how's the so, field of view on that pekka i don't know <laughs> it's very small yeah. <laughs> but it's 30 time uh, 30 so it's uh, quite small but yes. uh, this is a this is not the actual my first scope but it's uh, very similar i have the white one and uh, i earned it i i buy both it with my earned money I uh, because I was eight years old and we just moved from Finland to Sweden and uh, it was on the 70s and many uh, families moved from Finland to Sweden and and at the Christmas time uh, my father ordered Finnish Christmas cards to Sweden with Finnish uh, greetings text so I sell them to Finnish uh, people in uh, here in local area with Finnish greetings and they sent it to their family in Finland from Sweden and that was a very popular thing to do. So I earned my first telescope by my own money that time, wow. 75, wow. 75, mm. by selling Christmas card. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> nice. And, and Pekka in Sweden, do people, amateurs, uh, build their own telescopes or do they buy them? No, they buy them. They buy them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But we only have one store in whole Sweden. It's called Astro Sweden. And uh, they are out of stock for a long time ago. So, because uh, the uh, manufacturers and, uh, and, uh, and uh, general agents, they don't uh, pre-advertise just one small country and small uh, business. They pre exercise like FLO and uh, uh, TS, Telescope Express, Express in Germany. So I ordered very, very much from Germany and uh, England. Mm -hmm. Let's see who's watching this right now. We have a uh, pretty good audience going on right at the moment. Um, Looks like um, I think some of these people are from the last show that was that was on here, uh, but uh, yeah, it's definitely from the last show. I've had really good conversations from the last program. Uh, Paco was on with us in the afternoon, which was nice, and. Uh, Well, Carol Locke's back on with us, and um, Cameron, Cameron <laughs> Gillis, of course, you're right here. Um, Mick Whitaker, Mike Wiesner. Uh, Mick wants to know if James is having any luck tonight. So I think he's going he's to. Poly, he's in the middle of polar aligning right now. <laughs> yeah. So, so hopefully he's having some good luck with that. Yeah, we have a great program. Uh, I saw uh, Jason Gonzell also uh, log in, which is great. Carlos Hernandez Hello, is with us, yeah. And um, uh, we will have Dr. Daniel Barth, of course, David Levy, David Eicher, uh, Living in the Stars, um, and more. Ed Mass.
NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, we're leveraging our scientific and technical expertise to support NASA's bold Artemis initiative for a new era of crewed lunar exploration. We build and operate spacecraft and science instruments and analyze data and lunar samples to help us understand the moon, identify resources, and locate safe landing sites. We test science instruments in moon-like environments on Earth, providing valuable input to the design of hardware and strategies to be used by astronauts. Our researchers and partners study and model the sun's flow of energy and particles throughout wow. the solar system, which helps protect astronauts and spacecraft from harsh radiation. The science payloads we develop for NASA's Gateway will monitor space weather conditions from lunar orbit. We also oversee communications networks for NASA, providing two-way support and transmitting critical data. Optical communications will be demonstrated on Orion for potential use on future human spaceflight missions. Reliable navigation on and around the moon will be enabled by proven technology, onboard processing capability, and detailed data products. Back on Earth, astronaut location and safety during Orion splashdowns will be enhanced by the development of emergency locator beacons. Our Wallops flight facility assists with tracking and communication support for Orion, as well as launching uncrewed missions and payloads into low Earth and lunar orbits. Future missions will demonstrate sustainable and resilient spaceflight enabled by in-space robotic servicing, assembly, and manufacturing. The technologies we're developing will allow spacecraft to live longer and journey farther, so that when future explorers step foot on the moon with Artemis and take the next giant leap to Mars, Goddard, with our partners, will be there every step of the way. Wow, okay, so uh, welcome to the 36th Global Star Party. I can't believe we've done 36 of these things, um, but uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, I was reminded that we started them in the summer of last year, so we're not even quite a year into a 12-month you know, calendar year yet of, uh, of these Global Star Parties, so I'm hoping that uh, we can uh, get many more in uh, you know, I'd like to see a nice round number like 50 or something before we end up a 12 month cycle. So, but it's been a real pleasure to have, uh, you know, of course our guests on, uh, to have uh, our audience watching and our audience participating because we have opened up the program to uh, attend the after party, which, you know, I will again, post the uh, link to our Zoom waiting room where Kent Martz will be waiting for you. So starting at about 8.45 Central, uh, you can log into the waiting room. Kent will check your audio, your video, make sure that you're gonna be uh, 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 on topic for astronomy because that's what it's all about. And, um, and then we'll send you straight over to this Zoom link, okay, which is the live global star party that's being simulcast on Facebook, on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, uh, we are also on the homepage of cloudynights.com and uh, a couple of other sites as well. Um, I believe we're on uh, Ontario Telescope's website as well, which is really cool. Uh, we have uh, a great group as always. Um, and uh, so, you know, uh, just to recognize some of the people that are that are here uh, at the moment, because we have other people that will be logging on later, but we have Richard Grace over here, this is the way I see it anyways. Uh, Richard Grace is um, uh, up here with me. We have the, the red light you see kind of flashing by is uh, uh, James Hubbard, James the astrophotographer. He's out there uh, setting up and polar aligning. Dave Eicher, the editor-in-chief of Astronomy Magazine is with us. Uh, he's been doing this uh, almost marathon of uh, taking us, you know, through the universe, uh, you know, from some of the really kind of strange and scary stuff that can happen out there um, to, uh, you know, showing us the, uh, I think tonight is something to do with the distant scale of the universe. 
Libby in the Stars is with us. Libby uh, committed herself at the uh, very young age. She's still very young, but she started at 10 years old with uh, Global Star Party and committed herself to giving over 50 uh, lectures. And so I think she's being that this is the 36th, I think that she's done a couple of extras for us as well. So she's probably almost up to 40 lectures with us right now. And she's uh, really um, got uh, very, you know, I would say she's getting ex expert level giving a, a talk, especially for someone her age. Uh, Cameron Gillis, Cameron uh, watched us for a long time, joined into our after parties and, uh, you know, and, and started uh, showing us what he does with astrophotography, concentrating on smartphone astrophotography. The legendary Carlos Hernandez is with us uh, tonight. Uh, you, if you um, are on Facebook and are on these astronomy forums and stuff, you'll see Carlos's incredible space art, you know, and uh, uh, so he's with us today. Carlos has a lineage that, that goes all the way uh, back to, I guess, Percival Lowell uh, at, uh, at Lowell Observatory with people that uh, taught uh, how to do, you know, these incredibly detailed uh, drawings of the planets. And uh, Carlos does it better than anyone else I know. Uh, the incomparable David Levy is with us. Uh, he's uh, uh, not only inspired us with comet discoveries, his books, um, his lectures, uh, but uh, he does so with poetry at the beginning of every Global Star Party, which is awesome. The vast reaches, Jason Gonzell is with us uh, right now. And, uh, you know, mind-blowing astrophotography uh, that uh, when, I, when I think that he can't get any better, uh, he, does, he gets better every time. So it's just, uh, uh, just uh, amazing and remarkable. Super nice guy, uh, uh, you know, he's with us tonight. Pekka Hantela from Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, uh, Pekka was on earlier today uh, talking about his experiences on being on Global Star Party. Of course, uh, uh, very much like Cameron, he was watching us. I decided to participate in the after party and now he's, uh, he's really uh, giving it all he's got to uh, participate in Global Star Party and uh, we'll hear about his adventures here pretty soon. John Goss, uh, uh, former uh, president of the Astronomical League is with us tonight. He's representing the Astronomical League with, uh, as our official door prize sponsor, uh, very cool. And uh, Dr. Daniel Barth. Daniel is someone that uh, we've known each other for a very long time. Uh, uh, it just seems like this, you know, like there must be these parallel universes that somehow collide into each other. Um, Daniel and I uh, know each other from my Mead days when he was working at Scope City and uh, I was a, a young sales manager at that time. And so that was uh, very cool. He is now uh, a major uh, influencer in uh, uh, science in the state of Arkansas and, and indeed the country. And uh, he's um, uh, written a book on how to teach uh, uh, how to teach teachers to teach astronomy. So that's, and that has been going uh, somewhat viral at this point as a free download. So really cool. He's going to be starting a program with us starting on Monday. So a regular show once a week. Uh, Rodrigo Zaleda, the owner of uh, North Optics in uh, La Serena, Chile is on with us as well. So this is who's with us right now. We have others coming on, but uh, we're going to get started as we always do with, uh, with uh, Dr. David Levy. Um, he doesn't normally use his doctor's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, name, but uh, uh, but he is uh, extremely knowledgeable. Uh, he always uh, characterizes each one of our star parties. Uh, you know, just he just has the feel for uh, the the experience of being at one of these things. He's also got the you know when you go to star parties where he's there in person, uh, it's it's uh, it's amazing. And um, you know, people are always honored to be in his presence. I've been his friend for now decades, but I'm always honored to be in his presence too. Uh, he's a great friend. Um, when you make friends with David, uh, it's, it's for a lifetime. And uh, so David, thank you very much for being on the show and I'm gonna give you the stage. Well, thank you so much, Scotty. And it's such a pleasure to be with all of you. 
it's looking like our uh, GSB family just keeps on expanding, but it's very close and I really do enjoy it. Wendy and I have been living at this current site of Jarnak Observatory since 1996. And we've had our one of the main buildings of our observatory here since that time. But it's finally giving, starting to give up the ghost. And so on Sunday, our roof is going to need to be replaced on it. And fortunately, what we did to, to keep the open building dry is that we asked the uh, local city council to forbid any rain and they wouldn't do it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Wendy. And we prayed and that didn't do it. Then we went to the uh, state of Arizona and they wouldn't do it. So finally we went to the United States Senate and we asked them to pass a law forbidding rain over our observatory until the roof can be repaired. And they did. It was nice of them. It was very nice of them. It was passed 99 to zero. And the person who wasn't there to vote is here right now, I think with us. That's you, David. Anyway, uh, we, we, we're hoping it's not gonna rain. It hasn't yet. And starting Sunday, we're going to be getting a new roof. Uh, our po poetic introduction for this session of the Global Star Party number 36 is going to be dedicated to Libby and the stars and to her wonderful generation of thousands or millions of young people who all deserve the same chance that Libby's getting to enjoy the night sky. Just go out. You don't need a telescope. You don't even need binoculars. Although binoculars are fun, telescopes even more fun. But all you need is a little bit of an imagination, two good eyes, or a pair of glasses, and the night sky up there. And um, we would like to encourage all of you to get out whenever it's clear, even if it's just for five or 10 minutes, and look up at the night sky just to, just to see what's happening. As the sun goes down and the stars begin to come up, it kind of acts almost like a tranquilizer. It gives you the big picture of what's happening. The little details of your day begin to fade away. Yes. And when you look up at the night sky. Anyway, my poem today is by Lewis Carroll. It is called The Walrus and the Carpenter. And it goes like this. The sun was shining on the sea, shining with all his might. He did his very best to make the billows smooth and bright. And this was odd because it was the middle of the night. The moon was shining sulkily because she thought the sun had got no business to be there after the day was done. It's very rude of him, she said, to come and spoil the fun. Hmm. So if you want to hear more, you got to go outside and look up at the night sky and enjoy it. Bye to you, Scotty. Thank you very much, David. That's awesome. Okay. All right. So um, this is a uh, this is a star party. I don't know uh, if at this time we have anyone with a live image or or an image that they might have made or maybe a uh, a, a, a uh, some space art or something. But uh, I usually like to transition from one speaker to the next by doing something like that. If we don't have it right now, that's okay. But um, Anyone? Okay. Okay. All right. Then we will go straight on to uh, David Eicher. David, uh, David and I had a, a great conversation in the last Global Star Party, and we were talking about really the psychological and uh, kind of the spiritual benefits. I mean, I, if I can touch on spiritual uh, the, the benefit of being out under the night sky and uh, experiencing the universe from a, you know, a larger perspective, understanding the distances of things, um, but understanding too that all your problems are incredibly small uh, as we live on this unbelievably 
small little blue planet, you know, orbiting this average star as we hurl through space. Uh, it, uh, you know, you can, you can, uh, you can wallow in, in problems and they are, and they become magnified for you, but uh, you start, uh, you spend enough time out under the Milky Way, looking through your telescope, seeing across the light years, knowing that you're looking back into time, uh, this does help put things in perspective. And I, I, I personally believe that um, stargazing and astronomy is, is an excellent way to uh, regain, um, uh, you know, to, to reduce any kind of depression you might have or uh, to, um, to help, help your, your, you know, help yourself heal. You know, it is something that is really amazing and uh, David, uh, I saw David uh, uh, chime on about it later on Facebook, and I was really happy and pleased to see that because I, I know that he gets it. He is, uh, uh, it's something that a lot of astronomers don't talk a lot about, but we all know it's there. So, but uh, David, David is so eloquent in uh, the way that he can put words together and, uh, uh, and to just, uh, talk to us uh, as if we're his best friend, because I think he, he must be the kind of guy that can make instant best friends with al almost anyone. So, um, because he is, he, is a, he is also a best friend for me too. David, thank you very much. I'm gonna give you the stage. Thanks so much, Scott. It's great to be here with uh, new friends and old friends. Um, and I have a question actually, and if anyone would like to chime in on this to begin with, I would love that. I'd love to hear what you think. My question is, how large is the universe? So we will talk a little bit about perspective, about what astronomers call the cosmic distance scale, about how big everything is. But does, it, does anyone sort of have a gut feel? We know it's large, the universe. Does anyone have a feeling as to how large? 13.8 billion light years. 43. Okay, I'm sorry, David. 43. Okay. 42. Just 43. <laughs> 42. <laughs> hey, That's the answer is right, right. Because we can figure out the units later, you know. <laughs> but it's 43 of them. Yes. <laughs> Visible universe, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, let's talk about it a little, a little bit and we'll explore some of its uh, largesse here. Immediately after the Big Bang, of course, the universe was a very tiny place, but that was 13.8 billion years ago. The expanding universe means the universe, of course, now is unimaginably large and getting larger every day. This is one area that two generations of science fiction movies have seriously distorted in the minds of most of the public. In reality, we can't shoot around from star system to star system in cruisers at least yet or ever. The real universe is, as Douglas Adams uh, put it very eloquently, space is big, really big. And he was right about that. Even distances between the nearest objects are very large, uh, let alone distances between galaxies, of course. If the Milky Way were a model with stars being the size of grains of sand, then the disk of the galaxy would be 60,000 kilometers across and the closest star is six kilometers away from us, the Alpha Proxima Centauri system, of course. Astronomers call the size of the universe the cosmic distance scale. Let's consider the closest objects at first, the solar system. Well, let's imagine that the Earth-Sun distance, one astronomical unit is one centimeter on that scale. Just think about that. We've, we've traveled a tiny, tiny fraction then of that one centimeter, physically traveled. Uh, on that scale, however, Jupiter would be five centimeters away, Saturn 9.5 centimeters, Pluto uh, out in the vast reaches, if you will, 40 centimeters uh, away on that scale. And the physical edge of the solar system, the Oort cloud of comets would be about 10 football fields away on that scale. And we've traveled, of course, again, a tiny, 
tiny fraction of one centimeter on that scale. And the Oort cloud at 10 foot, 10, I'm gonna say it's not football season, so I'm gonna say 10 Lambeau fields, hoping we don't have any you know, rivalries going here. <laughs> um, but that, the, the 10 Lambeau fields there of distance is only about a quarter of the way to the nearest star. Moving outward to stars, we need to think of course in terms of light years. The distance light travels in one year at 186,000 miles per second. One light year, of course, that's the fastest speed there is. One light year is approximately six trillion miles, a long hike. The nearest star to the sun, Proxima Centauri is 4.2 light years away, the disk of our Milky Way galaxy, of course, stretches at least 100,000 light years across. There are some studies that are recent that suggest it's larger than that, but it's at least 100,000 light years across the bright disk of our galaxy. And the nearby galaxy, our friend who will eventually come and smack us right in the face, the Andromeda galaxy, of course, is 2.5 million light years away. But the universe, of course, is unimaginably larger yet. In the last couple of decades, we've gotten a good handle on the size of the cosmos, really for the first time. The current estimate is that the, the universe stretches across a diameter of about 93 billion light years. <clears throat> well, think about that a moment. If the universe is 13.8 billion years old and the speed of light is the fastest speed there is, how can that be? Because space itself expands over time. We need to get away from this thinking of the Big Bang as an explosion in an empty box that's filling the box with things. That's not what is happening. Space itself expands over time. So space over time interstitially expands. The one centimeter in the early universe of space itself uh, expands to become two centimeters and so on over time. Space and the objects within it are expanding. There's a rub, of course, to all of this. Um, one of you mentioned it uh, as we were teasing about an answer here a moment ago. Up to now, of course, we've been talking about the visible universe. In the 1970s, of course, two astronomers, Alan Guth at MIT and Andre Linde, uh, uh, they independently uh, proposed this idea of inflation theory. Of course, the idea that the universe, a fraction of a second after the Big Bang hyper expanded in size, which in explains a lot of what we see observationally in the current uh, universe, um, and let's let's uh, let's set that aside. That that really uh, brings some big problems to the size of the universe because it means that if inflation theory is correct, most cosmologists believe, of course, that it is. Um, that means that the universe, in fact, uh, could well be infinite, and that the visible universe that we see to the edge of the visible our view of the expanding universe is not nearly the entire universe. That of course sounds like science fiction, but it's not. So we know at a minimum, the universe stretches across 93 billion light years, a very, very long hike. And we know that unfortunately for our hopes, dreams and aspirations of some of us that traveling physically is possible in the universe um, over very, very long distances and at very high speeds, like the speed of light or a, some fraction of the speed of light, because for example, photons are massless. Things that have mass, even a relatively small amount of mass require an enormous amount of energy to move across long distances and to move at high velocities. So it's very, very unlikely that we will have uh, UFOs, meaning aliens, uh, who, you know, like in the movies, are bipedal organisms with eyes that look kind of vaguely like us, landing in Central Park and shaking hands with us and having dinner, you know, at Tavern on the Green. The distances, regardless of the technology, 
are incredibly vast, most astrophysicists would conclude, because the energy to move a lot of matter would be prohibitive to fly around and visit different parts of even the galaxy. So that's what we know about the incredible size of the galaxy that wasn't really known at all a generation ago with any certainty. Um, and it's amazing to think about when you're out standing underneath the Milky Way, the stars, to think about how incredibly vast it is, uh, but how amazing, Scott, as we said last week, that we can be made of the stuff of the universe here from Big Bang nuclear synthesis early on in the universe with hydrogen, helium, deuterium, and so on, or most of the atoms in, literally in our bodies made in supernovae or the mergers of neutron stars or other massive objects. Um, and we can look out into this vast, incredible universe that we'll never go and explore physically, uh, but we can understand what it is and what it means and talk to each other uh, through the miracle of electrons as well uh, about it like all by itself night after night so so that's an incredible thing it's a big 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 place as Douglas Adams said so succinctly hmm. wonderful wonderful now if that doesn't make your head just like spin I, I don't know what what would uh, <laughs> many of the, the comments here which I also uh, if you're chiming in on chat. Um, I do share those back on the chat with, internally with the people that are, that are giving presentations here too. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, a lot of people came up with a lot of different numbers as far as how big they thought the universe was. Uh, uh, Jeff Wise said 34 billion light years. Norm Hughes thought it was 28 billion. Um, uh, you know, I, don't know that we'll ever actually come up with the, the totally correct number because it seems like we're always making yet another observation and revising these things. But that is the process of science and for us to try to understand uh, reality and, and where we are and where we're going and all the rest of it. And so that's, that's a wonderful thing. Um, but uh, some, some people think that, uh, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's beyond the comprehension of the mind. Uh, they think that, um, you know, that it's, uh, uh, Book Davies says it's expanding into nothing, but it's really not a question. The universe is, and that's all. There is no outside of the universe. So yet another, you know, so there's. Um, that's, that's right. And, and it brings up, Scott, also this issue of, of multiverses, of multiple universes, which mathematically could um exist. Yeah. Uh, but of course, the very definition, we believe the very definition of science, of empiricism, of observation and experiments, what we can observe and test would prohibit us from seeing anything that is outside our universe. So it becomes an academic exercise until the last couple or three years when some cosmologists say, well, maybe there could be some kind of an indication in our universe of the presence of another, you know, may, maybe we'll never know. And of course, if the universe is infinite, we'll never presumably for sure know that either. Mm -hmm. But, you know, th these things are possibilities. Yes. Um, but do we have evidence for them? No, not yet. Um, and of course you can't, as we talked about last week also, it, it's fun and it's wonderful. And, and, you know, working at home here, you know, sometimes I have a little Star Trek on in the back, you know, we, we love our entertainment, but you can't pick and choose when you want to follow scientific reasoning. Mm -hmm. If you're a scientific thinker, yeah, you have to follow science all the time, not when it suits you <laughs> and not accept it when you don't like it. So yeah. you've got to systematically believe in empiricism and science. And right now that's telling us that there could be other universes. We have no evidence for them there. We may never have any evidence for them. We don't know what happened before the big bang. We most likely of course never will. And that's what Einstein loved to argue about with Niels Bohr and others. And uh, we may never know the true extent of the universe. We know it's at least 
93 billion light years, but that may only be the visible universe. Right, right. How, how about the concept? Uh, one thing I wanted to ask, this is a really fascinating subject to me. Uh, maybe it's immeasurable in the, in the sense that uh, like a mo you have a, imagine a Mobius strip, right? Mm -hmm. um, a Mobius strip is just a two-dimensional mm -hmm. version of the universe. Mm -hmm. And then you take that to the next dimension, a four-dimensional Mobius where basically it, you just, you end up, if you keep on going in one direction, you end up in the same location. Yes. Uh, so, so basically when you look at the observable universe, 13.8 billion, that's the edge. You, ha you have the cosmic background radiation. But what happens is if you follow the logic of, of uh, the universe actually expanding, at some point it was smaller. So actually when you're looking further away, you're actually looking at a converging distance. So the distances are becoming smaller because it's, it's expanding because you're looking back in time. So you actually yeah. are folding in itself. So in effect, maybe the universe is only 13.8 billion years or beyond that, beyond the light years, there is a, the event, if you will, if you believe in the expansion theory, right? Where it becomes a single point. And so you actually look far enough beyond the observable universe. And then you actually can look so that in any direction you face, it actually converges on a point. You follow what I'm saying? I do, and that's a very interesting point and very interesting question, and it brings up a couple of interesting related things. The cosmological parameter results most recently from the Planck satellite, which give us everything we believe we know about the nature of matter, energy, and age of the universe, and, and therefore size and so on and also a related matter that, that weighs in on exactly what you were talking about, uh, Cameron, and that is the shape of the universe. And maybe, that's a, maybe that should be an upcoming thing that I'll talk a little bit about in a week or two or three, because the shape of the universe is also not well known and weighs in on these issues as well. Yeah, yeah. Like, can I share my screen quickly? Sure. I, I just want to uh, put some notes here. So basically, um, so you see, can you see my screen? Mm -hmm. So there's this, uh, you know, this is kind of a three-dimensional Mobius. It's called Sydney's uh, Mobius Band. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is, but this is just, again, at only three dimensions. But because the universe is beyond four dimensions, we cannot visualize this. It's difficult to conformally map that universe in a, in a three-dimensional space. So sure. here's, a, here's a Klein bottle version of the same. So again, the concept of as you look back, you're actually, eventually you look at yourself, right? At back in an earlier point in time. So uh, anyhow, this, just that's kind of a visualization of, of this, which we can extend uh, beyond, uh, to, to our observable universe, perhaps. Perhaps I should add a, a, a shape of the universe talk in here as well to try to summarize that, which is a very interesting and deeply related matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But we, know less, we know even less about it now than we do about the size of the universe. But it's interesting to consider the possibilities. Sure. Well, like black holes could be just little, they're, they're like folds in the universe, right? So they are uh, basically bumps in the road, uh, but they, they help morph the shape. So you have this larger shape, but then you have these uh, contours, if you will, caused by black holes, right? Which fold time and space. Space time is curved around very massive yeah. objects and including black holes. Yep. <laughs> Anyhow, so There's some great comments. Good there. stuff. Yeah, yeah. And some questions. Okay. One question is, uh, you know, what is the universe expanding into? It's not. The universe is everything that there is. And again, our instinct, thinking about the Big Bang, is that it's like a grenade going off in a room that's filling the room with something. But there is no edge and no center of the universe. This is one of the questions that we get most frequently with Ask Astro. Uh, at the magazine, which is an incredibly popular department of, of questions about 
such things, um, all of all of space is expanding. <clears throat> yeah. So it's not like it's expanding into a pre-existing volume. You know what I mean? So that's, that, that's, that's very what, difficult for people to get their heads wrapped around. Oh, oh I know. And, and it's very difficult for you to believe when Alex Filipenko tells you that the universe very likely is infinite. That seems counterintuitive and nonsensical as well, but that's what the evidence points to. It's infinitely finite. <laughs> <laughs> the linguists would like that at least. <laughs> Another question. Uh, yeah. uh, let's see, this is from... Uh, David, can, can David mention what part guitars play in the universe? <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, you can actually get this shirt. This is a shirt that Brian May gave me, and it's Brian May Guitars. I oh, finally wow. got around to wearing uh, uh, a, a rock and roll shirt here on one of these. Yeah, I like it. So these are actually, Brian has a guitar company that he produces replicas of the red special and other guitars that you can buy from brian may guitars and they also make these shirts very cool well so as, you know if every if it's all part of the universe then everything's part of the universe right well so, as brian said you know, guitars you got to use both hemispheres of the brain you know there's science and there's also rock and roll that's right that's right um what other good question do we have here uh there, there's mentions of string theory. Um, Book Davy says, have you ever noticed a lot of amateur astronomers or amateur musicians too? Absolutely. A lot. Yes. Mm -hmm. And according again, to refer back to Brian, Brian claims that a lot of musicians have been very interested in the sky and he's taken a lot of them over, out, over the years out to, to, look at the stars when he's been on tour. So there is, you know, quite quite an intellectual bridge there. Start probably starting in a serious way with William Herschel. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, Scott, uh, David Eicher is also an excellent drummer. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, Carlos. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Well, I know he's a musician, so. Uh, I have yet to see him perform live yet. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that day, so. There's something we'll have to do at a star party sometime. Yep, that'll be cool. That'll be cool. <laughs> On a cloudy night. <laughs> <laughs> yep. It would be awesome. Even during a clear night, that would be all right with me. <laughs> um, our next speaker is uh, our youngest speaker, which is 11-year-old uh, Libby in the Stars. And Libby uh, has covered many topics, um, ranging from uh, the... Uh, nebula, uh, nebulas, black holes, um, uh, star formation, uh, uh, the you know distances, distance scale of, of the you know the solar system, the galaxy, um, and uh, she always has a you know she's learning uh, not only about the universe herself, but she's learning about. Uh, uh, more about space exploration. She's ravenous to find out more information. She's literally read every book in her school library about space exploration and astronomy. Uh, uh, so, you know, uh, anybody's got uh, some free books they'd like to send Libby's way, she'll, she'll take them and read them. She is currently reading uh, some of David Levy's uh, books, um, uh, which is great, and uh, some of David Eicher's books. Uh, and... Um, you know, so uh, she's uh, she's getting the education of a lifetime. Before we started broadcasting, uh, we started talking to Libby about uh, the fact that she is living in the golden age of astronomy. Uh, David Eicher pointed out that uh, uh, never at any time has uh, humanity experienced the rate of discovery, uh, the breakthroughs in discovery that we're making about uh, learning about the universe, which is really learning about who we are, ourselves, you know, our origin story, uh, and all the dimensions that, that, uh, that we somehow are connected to. So um, Libby, I'm going to turn this uh, conversation over to you. Um, okay. How are I'm, you tonight? 
So I'm talking about uh, the life of a star. I made a presentation to share. So here, share that. Uh, this week, last weekend, um, oh Lord, uh, how do I share that? Uh, okay, there we go. Uh, can't find a big screen button. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so I made a presentation. Last Saturday, I took a huge trip up to Mount Magazine, and I just got to learn a lot about the stars. Um, I live right next to a highway with many street lights and things that are very preventable from you doing astronomy. So um, it was a long drive up to Mount Magazine, which is the highest point in Arkansas. And we were we were out on a little lookout and uh, it was sort of eerily dark out there, which I did not like much. So we had put the telescope on top of the car and I sat on top of the sunroof with my legs dangling down into the car. And I just had my, tel it, it was a tiny telescope. Uh, the Tasca one that I got fixed up used to be my grandpa's old telescope. And I don't even know how old that thing is, but it was very mm -hmm. exciting to fix up an old telescope of my grandpa's. And it, we don't even know how old it is. He, did, we ha he hasn't said how old he's had it, but. It uh, just felt nice to use an old telescope, and I got to learn a lot about the stars. My goal on that trip to wasn't try and do too much astrophotography, because all I have to worry about at home is taking pictures, and every time I look through my telescope, I'm like, hurry, take a picture before it moves, and, uh, and I just told my mom, I said, my goal on this trip is to not take a picture of anything I find even if I want to, just because I always spend all that time taking pictures and not just observing myself. And I saw many stars out there and started to realize how important they are because stars, they make planets, they make supernovas, and just being a star alone, that's all we look at in the sky. Like with our telescopes, that's what we look at 24-7, nebulas, stars, galaxies, other planets. That's pretty much the whole night sky. And so uh, all of that is made up of stars. And I started to realize that we would not exist either. It would just be blackness, dark, nothing, <laughs> just, just gravity. And, uh, and how important they are because, I mean, Everything is made out of stars. Even us humans, we're made out of stars, everything. And the life cycle of a star, it seems so short, but really when you look at the timeline of it, it lasts of, of like five million, millions of years. And a lot of, you know, a lot of, there's a lot of steps in it. Um, so when you look at a nebula and uh, you see like tiny little stars and tiny little stars and then like becoming stars, those are protostars. So they're building up material to be big enough to be a star so that they can explode in a while or do whatever they want. So the main sequence star is uh, just a normal star in the sky, probably about halfway through life. And uh, now it has to, uh, now it has to, uh, chemically, stars don't have minds, but they just, eat, they either die off normally or they like explode, supernova, <laughs> crazy. Um, and I found this chart helpful for a lot of people to understand. Um, the protostar, the main sequence star, and then you see it goes down into, um, Two, where it can either just start to lose power and die off, or it can burst into a supernova. 
And uh, and I found this interesting. Like, how does this change? Like, like does like I wonder how many more stars in the solar system just become a red giant star and just die off like that? Or how many like that depends how big the universe is. Connecting to earlier um, depends how big the universe is because. How many stars decide to become a supernova? How many stars just decide to die off? And I know a lot of people say on this call, we like to mention a lot that we are actually all made out of stars. And um, realizing that like everything is a star, stars are important. And I think a lot of people need to realize that we're all stars and that astronomy is very important because this could lead us back to the beginning of our universe. Like it was just blackness. How did the first star get into our universe? How did the first star explode? Did the first star just become a red giant star and die? Or did it, or was there a second star that became a supernova? And uh, it, there's a lot of tracing back to the beginning of time in space and the first star that you know created a whole entire uh the whole entire universe basically us everything the ground the grass earth our solar system our sun our star and um i feel like tracing back to the beginning of time is very important for a lot of people to do um not like for many education purposes, this can help in many ways. You know, we can learn how Earth is like, how did we get on Earth? How are humans first on Earth? Like dinosaurs on Earth, the meteor that came on Earth and killed the dinosaurs, like not to repeat history again. And, um, I know that's a huge part of our day, of our age, the golden age of astronomy, which you were talking about earlier, how uh, it's amazing to be in this age because we have all these uh, resources to help us go back and learn. I mean, you can't Google what was the beginning of time. You probably won't get the answer because NASA has been working on that for how many years now? <laughs> but uh, there's so much education and resource and the second that NASA finds out the beginning of time and how we all started, we can all share that information. And who knows, maybe even another universe is out there and it can lead to more discoveries and, you know, just Earth conquering space. And um, I started to realize that all of the beautiful stuff that we look at in space is all made from stars and they're very important and that's when you need to get people interested in astronomy, realizing how important stars are in everybody's lives, you know. You know, us, we all are stars. Everybody is. <laughs> um, the whole earth and everything. And um, if there weren't any stars, we'd just be looking at just gravity in the sky. It just, it wouldn't be this beautiful nebula, you know, how even did that get there? You know, you have to understand this whole family branch of stars just out there who created the Orion Nebula. And um, there's like a lot of history behind it. Um, not even looking back at Earth's history of when the humans first got here, but way back a long time ago, which seems like a fictional thing. But there was a beginning of time, and if so, the whole world is going to conquer it, and we're going to find out the beginning of time. Beautiful. Um, Beautiful. You know what, Libby? I think that you have uh, you have had uh, some profound uh, thoughts, and uh, I I know when I was 11 years old, I didn't have such incredible thoughts as, as you're having now. So um, I was very much wrapped up in the um, 
you know, the adventure and the thrill of exploring the universe, but I had not come to the realization of, uh, of you know, that we are truly all made of, of uh, and everything's made from stardust, you know, so, um, so I, I think that, uh, I think that you, uh, the way that you put it uh, so clearly and uh, uh, eloquently, I think that uh, you've come a long way. Libby, congratulations. Thank you. And that's a I beautiful Orion Nebula behind you. Yeah, and that Orion Nebula slide, your last slide was beautiful. Really like that one. Yeah. Okay. All right, so um, let's, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Carlos Hernandez uh, with us tonight. I know that uh, he might be called away at any moment. Uh, he is a, you know, a practicing uh, doctor and uh, so I, it's very difficult for him to get away. Um, I've been begging for him to come on to the program uh, to share some of his space art. Carlos, is it okay? Can you, uh, can you share some with us? For a little while here. Right. Yes. Okay. Uh, Scott, do you have the uh, the images I sent you, or did you want me to post uh, my own? You, you you post them. Just go ahead and share them from your own computer. Okay. Just give me one moment, please. Thank yeah. You. Also wanted to comment on Libby's uh, that that was a nice flow chart uh, that you had there on the star. Yeah, star evolution. That was really nice. Very clear. Yes. Well done. Okay, just give me one more. Thank you. I'll be right with you. Anyway, okay. Let me go to the photos. No, excuse me a moment. I was just, uh, I thought it's okay. it was uh, it's okay. sharing the one that you had. But let me see if I can find it. You see the little green share button at the bottom of your Zoom client? It says share screen. Yeah. Yes, I see that. Yes. Okay. You click on that and then. Uh, you'll see options for what you can share, whether it's just uh, one of your apps or your whole screen. Okay. So you might want to, if you're on PowerPoint, you might just click on the PowerPoint app itself. Okay. And then you hit share and away you go. Let me see. Those of you who might have heard of people like uh, Don Parker, uh, Tippi Dioria, Chick Capon, uh, you know, some of these astronomers that uh, many of them were in uh, Florida and I guess connected all the way up through Illinois, um, uh, you know, are, were very close friends of uh, Carlos, Carlos Hernandez, and that team did some amazing uh, observations of uh, the planets. Uh, I re recall um, Tippy Doria, and I, I'm not sure who Tippy was with. It might have been Tippy and Don, or you know, Carlos knows the real story. But uh, it was predicted that they would see this this flash, uh, this flash effect on Mars, and it was this kind of transient phenomena that uh, they weren't sure if it was an artifact or you know some other effect, but um, uh, they made a prediction that they would be able to see it on a particular op, uh, 
opposition of Mars at a certain time and all the rest of it. And uh, they all went out, uh, I guess, with video and were able, or maybe with a quick uh, exposure camera, and they were able to capture this uh, effect once again. So you know, it's just really some amazing stuff. Um, of course, with uh, you know these guys doing such high resolution work, uh, you know, and a guy like Carlos uh, making careful technical drawings of the planets, it was really a, an amazing team of. Uh, of planetary photographer or planetary astronomers. Be right with you. And I actually, Scott, I actually started observing about the age of Libby. And ironically, when I was about her age, I was receiving pamphlets from the Mariner 9 orbiter from oh, NASA. Wow. And that's, that's actually when I first got exposed to the planet Mars back in 1971. That's cool. About Libby's age. And then from then on, it was the Viking uh, landers and all the other spacecraft that came afterwards. And uh, as a background, I, I've been doing space art um, for about 20, 25 years now. And uh, the interesting thing is I've been able to improve my art and also have a better appreciation of uh, astronomy and everything else associated with it. Now, let me see if I can fix this. Desktop. Okay, there we Trying to get to my desktop to show my slides. Excuse me, mm -hmm. give me one sec. Let's see. There we go. There it is. Okay. Here we go. All right. Okay. This is a um, a painting, a digital. Most, uh, I started as most uh, artists drawing, you know, with a pencil, uh, charcoal, and then did uh, watercolor and acrylics and things like that. But eventually I got involved with uh, the computer and, and digital art, and digital painting, and I uh, used a graphics tablet along with the computer. And I produced my paintings uh, using uh, Adobe Photoshop, which is an application a very popular one for photo manipulation and for painting. This is a painting of the United Launch Alliance rocket that launched the Perseverance Mars rover on July 30th, 2020. It's an Atlas V 541 rocket and uh, it launched it on July 30th, 2020. And after approximately a seven month journey, it finally reached the planet Mars on February 18th of this year, 2021. Hmm. It totally looks like a photograph. Thank you. Nice. Then on February 18th, uh, this is another digital painting. The uh, Mar Perseverance Mars rover and helicopter were inside this capsule and heat shield as in, it encountered the atmosphere of the planet Mars, even though it's not as extensive as our own, it uh, does cause uh, any object falling into it to develop uh, an intense friction and heat. And at about a thousand uh, miles above the surface, the uh, probe started to encounter the, uh, the atmosphere of Mars. And as it was entering the atmosphere, the friction created a temperature, produced a temperature of 3,800 3, degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 1,300 Celsius uh, over the uh, capsule as it entered the atmosphere. And this is the beginning of the famous uh, seven minutes of terror as the uh, probe, the capsule, 
enters Mars, the atmosphere, and we lose contact with the probe. And uh, this is the uh, seven minutes of terror. Amazing. Then as the probe enters the atmosphere, Perseverance is still within its capsule and heat shield. And at approximately 70 miles above the surface of Mars, the parachute opens up to slow it down. So it was going at a speed at 1,000 miles above of uh, 13,000 miles an hour at that, at that altitude. Wow. And because of the friction, and now with the help of the parachute, it slowed its speed down to 9% of that speed at seven miles above the surface. So you see the, uh, the capsule and the probe and the, it entering slowly into the atmosphere of the planet Mars. Amazing. So Carl, as, as you're describing this, it's, it really, you really understand kind of the physics of it as you're putting the artistic uh, effects, right? Yes, that's why I, I try to, um, I mean, I, I enjoy producing my paintings, but I try to make them so that it explains what is occurring in nature and what we're seeing and the uh, incredible images that are being returned by Perseverance and other probes. So I try to combine uh, both science and art and in, in my paintings mm -hmm. to make them as accurate as possible. That's cool. Really, that that's is good. cool. This is a painting showing the uh, what's called the sky crane, which is a sort of a, a rocket sled that separated from the capsule that we saw previously. And uh, that occurred about a mile, uh, a mile or so above the surface of Mars. And then it's being, uh, you see the uh, rover beneath the Perseverance rover, and it's connected to the sky crane above by three nylon ropes and an umbilical cord. And as, the, as they descend towards the surface, at approximately 40 feet above the surface, the sky crane uh, lowers the Perseverance robe onto the surface. And as soon as it touches, the Perseverance rover touches the surface, the sky crane cuts the cables and flies away from the rover so that it doesn't crash into it. And this occurred on February 18th of this year. Yeah, the live, or not live video, but the video that they showed was just amazing. It was just some of the most incredible things that I'd seen. And your, your, your paintings are so incredibly detailed, you know? Well, thank you, Scott. Um, and this is the actual Perseverance rover uh, over the surface of uh, Mars. It landed in the Northern hemisphere of the planet within a crater called Jezero Crater, named after a town in Bosnia, Herzegovina. And it means it's translated to lake because the uh, Jezero Crater is believed to have contained a lake of water approximately three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago uh, when the atmosphere of Mars was denser and water may have existed over the surface of the planet. So at that time, there could have been a lake there. And that's why the Perseverance rovers is there, because it's going to look for evidence of past water and possible life, if there was water. Awesome. It's like, Carlos, you're, you're telling a scientific story, story through art. It's beautiful. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Now, a companion of the Perseverance rover, and uh, the nickname for the Perseverance rover, robots, and the Perseverance ro Mars rover is named Percy. Now accompanying uh, the, the rover is a technology, uh, a new technology called the, a Mars helicopter called Ingenuity. The, the nickname for this one is Ginny, Ginny. So you got Percy and Ginny. Now, um, this is the new technology. Now, the thing about flying a helicopter on Mars is that the atmosphere of Mars is only 6% that of, that of the Earth's. So you need a, a, a heavier, thicker atmosphere 
for a helicopter, a normal helicopter to work over the surface. So the scientists and the engineers had to come up with a design that, of, uh, of the planet Mars. And so what they did was they developed a, a helicopter about the size of a bread box. It's about 19 inches tall and the legs are about uh, 15 inches long. Now the rotors, there's two counter rotors here that each of them are four feet long, four feet long or about a little bit over one meter in length. And the reason is, is because to uh, be able to have lift in the atmosphere of the planet, you have to have large rotors. Now, the other thing that's required is in order to overcome, to develop lift in such a tenuous thin atmosphere, uh, it has to go very, very fast. And so the rotors in, on this uh, helicopter on Ginny have to rotate at 2,400 RPMs uh, rotations per minute. And that's five times the typical rotation speed of a helicopter on the Earth. But that's because of the atmosphere of the planet. Um, now, Ginny is still tucked. It's tucked underneath Perseverance because uh, it's going through its own uh, check checkout, uh, the rover, but uh, they're also waiting to make sure that the local conditions are such that they can release the helicopter over the surface of the planet. Because um, once the helicopter is released from the, the rover, it's on its own and it's getting power now from the rover. But once it's released, it's going to re rely solely on solar power and lithium batteries that it contains. Mm. But uh, the other thing is that the temperature over the surface of Mars gets down to minus 130 degrees Ooh. Fahrenheit. So a lot of the energy that Jenny and Perseverance uh, generate is in order to overcome that extreme cold temperature yeah. over the surface of Mars. Uh, so they have to make sure that that it can have power on its own and uh, survive the Martian night. Uh, and that should be within the next 30 to 60 days. Or in, on Mars, it's called a SOL, S-O-L. And that's uh, approximately uh, one SOL is 40 minutes longer than a day on Earth. Mm -hmm. So in about 30 or 60 days, they hope to be able to release Ginny so they can do a test flight. Now they plan on doing five, up to five test flights of Jenny, and it's gonna fly up to an altitude of up to 16 feet, about nine, six meters or so, and um, for up to 90 seconds. And they're, they're hoping to get five flights out of Jenny and possibly more, depending on every, all the conditions. And this is a, a new technology because they hope to create, develop future helicopters uh, for exploration of Mars. But the future ones are gonna be bigger and they're gonna be based upon what they learn from Ginny uh, when they, once they test the uh, technology. Amazing. Yeah, I, I'm very excited about this. Uh, Carlos, there's, um, uh, comments are, you know, the Beatrice Sciences and Speechless Carlos. It's so beautiful. Um, uh, you know, the, um, the details, your expressiveness in, uh, in capturing these moments, you know, uh, it, it, they're, they're very personal. Uh, they're very technically accurate, but they're also very personal as if, you know, you're almost standing there, you know, so it's very cool. Well, th thank you. And that's because also because of the incredible uh, images uh, obtained by spacecraft in the past of, about the conditions on the surface of Mars and Mars mm -hmm. and uh, everything we've learned about it. So using that information that we've, lear we've learned in the past, I'm able to, to produce these uh, paintings and uh, I also enjoy doing it. Mm. Um, this is a painting showing the possible what, if you were standing on the surface of Mars, uh, about 100 meters away uh, next to the Perseverance, 
this was this is what the first test flight of Jenny might look like because um, when it drops it on the surface, the, the rover has got to move 100 meters back so it doesn't crash, to, so the, the helicopter doesn't crash into it. And so the first test will be up to a, a height of 16 feet and it'll last for approximately 90 seconds. And this is what it might look like to an observer, an astronaut on the surface of Mars. Very cool. Now the crater that the Perseverance rover is going to is called Jezero Crater. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, they think that there was water in it, uh, within it, approximately three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago. And that's because the atmosphere of Mars was a lot heavier, a lot thicker then, and then it could sustain the, the surface pressure for water. Um, this is what it looks like at the current time, based upon orbiter images of the crater. And um, in the far distance, you can see the opening of a channel, or what used to be a channel. And the red dot at the left lower part of the image of uh, this painting, it's a painting, uh, is where the approximate uh, location of the Perseverance rover. And the rover is going to be moving all around this area, uh, looking at using its uh, vast uh, array of instruments to analyze the rocks and the uh, the soil in order to determine uh, if there was a presence of water and possible possible life, but mostly looking for uh, chemical chemistry and other uh, things that it will indicate that there was water over the surface of Mars at this location in Mars. Amazing. What, a, now, what an exciting place for them to explore. Awesome pictures. If, if we were, awesome. Art. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. If we were able to be on Mars three and a half to 3.8 billion years ago, this is what Jezero Crater would have looked like. I call this Jezero Lake because it's not just a crater, it's a lake. So if water was present, at this location in Jezero Crater up in the Northern Hemisphere of Mars, then you can see the channel in the distance bringing the water into the, into the, uh, the lake. And uh, this is a scene of what uh, an astronaut or someone on the surface of Mars would have seen at, uh, over the, uh, loca the present location of Jezero Crater. And here we have a painting of uh, Percy doing his thing, uh, analyzing rocks and stuff within Jezero Crater in the near future. Now it's moved a little bit uh, and they showed some pictures of, of its tracks moving, but it's, it's just going through motion of making sure that everything's working, the wheels, the instruments and everything. But eventually it will move out. It will move out within the crater, um, just like Curiosity. Uh, and uh, it will start to explore the, uh, the environment, including the rocks, looking for evidence of uh, water and uh, other elements and, and possible life, if, if it did exist at that time. Hey, Carlos, I just realized something. Do you have multiple monitors? Uh, not at this time, no. Okay, because I think what's happening is we're seeing your, your big thumbnails but we're not seeing a full, are you trying to show us a full screen? I, I'm trying to, why? It doesn't show up on your screen? It shows only the, the, the large thumbnails. It's still good. I didn't want to interrupt your flow too much, but I, I just, the images are so, for the artist so nice, I would like, it would be great if you could get a full, full screen. You can plug it into the app. You can plug it into your, your computer. Your oh, screen. somebody has, uh, has to mute. What the weather conditions are like. Yeah. Hold on. And then you can be Are you able to mute the... Uh... Yeah, let me see. Just while we're talking, as it has lived, there's M13 coming. Yeah, okay. so that's, that's live capturing as well. I hear Gary in the background. <laughs> as we're talking away. 
that, that, that's just my main thing here. We, so we, while you're doing that, uh, uh, Carlos, um, Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's try to move that picture because uh, we don't see the full screen. Okay. So see, see if you can, um, uh, I don't know if there's, like, if you go uh, Alt, hold on Alt Tab, are you on a PC? Uh, I'm on a Mac. Okay. Um, yeah, because you, you want to be able to share the, that that full screen view somehow. Is it possible to double click on the image and have it bring up full screen as a preview or as a view? I think that's what I was doing. I was assuming. The other thing is it's it's muted because when you highlight the image, it mutes the mutes the image. It that's makes more the colors dull. A little bit more grayed out. Try scrolling down, to, uh, 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 clicking clicking on another image, and then just scrolling. Uh, to the side so that you bring up the image that you want to see and that, that might actually show a better. Oh yeah, that's a good idea, Scott. Maybe you just click yeah. on. Click on the yeah, image maybe. just above this one. Uh, Carl. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. Now your mouse is right over this picture, but uh, go to the picture above it and click on that without, without moving the position. Okay. So right now we still see your mouse is in the, in the middle of the screen. Okay, does that improve the image here? No, I think you're seeing something different than what we're seeing. Yeah, it looks like the screen is frozen. Okay. Are you changing your mouse location? Yes. Yeah, so you probably stop sharing and reshare again. Yeah, and then refresh it because it's uh, it got hung up. Okay, I can I can do that. I can do that. Um, I'm I'm almost done with the with the presentation. I'm sorry. So, uh, no, it's okay. <laughs> it, it just it, it's just such nice. Uh, they're beautiful art. It would be nice to see. Be <laughs> good. <laughs> um, let me uh, let me just finish, and what I'll do is I'll go back into my system preferences and try to see if I can share. And then I'll just uh, real quickly show uh, when we have an opportunity. Okay, uh, that's a great idea. Yeah, great idea. Yeah. Thanks. You know yeah. No, thanks for pointing that out. So thank you. Um, and this is the last uh, painting that I wanted to show. And one of the things that the Perseverance Rover is doing is uh, accumulate. It's and it's. Uh, Yeah, it's um, sh it's it's going to collect samples of the surface into these test tubes, and it's going to drop them over the surface of Mars. And a future uh, space probe is that's going to be a uh, produced by the European Space Agency and NASA is going to fly to Mars and uh, land on Mars, pick up the uh, test tubes, and take them to a ascent rocket. And that rocket will take it to orbit around Mars and a spacecraft orbiting Mars is going to pick that up and bring it to the Earth and hopefully bring back samples of the surface of Mars by 2031. Awesome, that is amazing. Yeah, cool. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll try to figure out how to share so you can see the full screen and I'll let Scott continue. Okay. Awesome. All right. While you're doing that in the background, we are going to transition to John Goss from the Astronomical League, and um, uh, who uh, the Astronomical League is the official sponsor of the um, door prizes for the Global Star Party. And uh, so uh, they start off with uh, uh, they they the officers rotate. Uh, so you know they. Everyone gets a chance to uh, to do these questions and participate. Um, the way that it works is you send in your answers to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. And I will write that down here in the chat. So you're not going to answer it in chat because you can't win that way. Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. 
uh, correct answers are picked, you know, the, uh, no matter how many people uh, get correct answers, we then take at random one of the winners and uh, uh, that winner, winner is announced. And the reason why we do it that way is that we're simulcasting. And if you are watching YouTube versus Twitch or Facebook versus uh, Twitter, uh, you may find that one of the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, streams is a little faster than the other. So we do it this way so that we don't, uh, we give everybody an equal chance. But uh, John, I'm gonna turn it over to you, okay? Already, already. Thank, thank you, Scott. Um, before I begin the question and answers bit, I was just uh, thinking of I, what everyone's been saying tonight, uh, starting out with uh, David Levy and recommending that everyone go outside and look up and see what's up in the sky for themselves. Um, and then I started thinking about what um, uh, Dave Iker said, some of the numbers he gave, uh, this 93 billion light year wide universe, um, you know, fantastic numbers that we can comprehend. And then hearing what, what, what Libby was saying about the number of stars and the uh, size of the galaxy being 100,000 light years wide and all this. Well, it's, it's kind of been my, but been my experience that uh, what, ha, what draws some people to amateur astronomy or to astronomy are the, the astronomical numbers we all see. And you know everyone here is talking about these huge numbers. They're talking about uh, infinity. Uh, they're talking about eternity. Um, so there are a lot of huge numbers we, we deal with in this hobby. Um, but there's another number which I think is, is, is as important or it is as intriguing to people, uh, not just infinity or eternity, but the lonely number one. Uh, number one is the number of known inhabitable planets. Yes. Uh, you know, you go out and look at, look at the stars, everyone starts talking about how big the universe is, and always the conversation comes down to being how many other civilizations are out there. Well, so far, if you count us. <laughs> uh, so the whole hobby r ranges the whole gamut of, of scales, of numbers, from both uh, distance and time, from one up to eternity or infinity. 93 billion light years. Okay, enough of that. Um, get on here with some of these questions. Da, 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 da. What we'd like to do, you do see my screen, correct? <laughs> Hope so. Yes. Okay, uh, what we like to start each session is, is trying to remind people uh, the hazards of looking at the sun through improper equipment through uh, improper filters. Um, looking at the sun is really pretty easy. It's very rewarding if you have the right filters. So if, if you're not uh, familiar with how to do this, um, get advice in person from someone who does. Um, if it's done correctly, it's not dangerous at all, but it has to be done correctly. Okay, answers from last uh, Global Star Party. Uh, choosing among, a, a, excuse me, Choosing among um, um, young stars uh, uh, with different colors, blue star uh, and, and uh, red star, yellow star, which one is the hottest? Well, blue, uh, since it emits the shorter wavelength of light, is the hottest, uh, and red would be the coolest in this scheme of things. Oh, I'm sorry. Back there. And the winner of that was Richard Grace. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> so th this is from the, the last star, star party. Okay, the, the dog days of August come from the Egyptians when they thought that the, the, the extra heat from the dog star combined with the sun to create a, a, a hot, hot days in the winter. Uh, what star did Egyptians call the dog star? I'm going through this pretty rapidly. Well, uh, James Hubbard, hey, there he is, James. Um, Sirius, now during the summer, Sirius is, is high in the sky along with our own sun in, in the daytime sky and the Egyptians felt that that's what caused the extra heat. Number three from last week. Uh, the manned and unmanned missions have landed on planetary moons. Uh, of course, there's the Earth's moon, 
what is the, the, the moon seen here? Well, they've been landed on, they have landed on two moons, uh, Saturn's moon Titan, along with our Earth's moon. Winner is Andrew Corkill. Thank you, Andrew. Questions for this time around. Um, this is kind of in, in, reflects to what uh, da David Levy was saying, you know, go out and look, look for yourself, go out tonight and see what's up. Right now, the only, only bright planet in the uh, early evening sky over the next two months is Mars. For a couple of weeks, every two years, including from tonight through early next week, the red planet slides between two prominent star clusters. What are the two clusters? A, the Beehive and the Coma Berenices open cluster, B, M8 and M20, C, Pleiades and Hyades. So again, after this uh, star party is concluded, go out and look, look tonight and see what you can see uh, about Mars and where it is. That's the first question. Second, with a spiffy new telescope, Galileo observed many so-called nebula, some of which we no longer recognize as being nebula. Uh, in particular, he, he called one Nebulosa Orionis. What do we call it today? A, the trapezium stars. B, Lambda Orionis and surrounding stars. C, M42, M43. One more question, which I, I try to focus on the Astronomical League so you know a little bit more about it. About how many volunteers does the Astronomical League have who contribute to the operations of the organization, making it a success? A, 100 more. B, the five members of the National Council. C, 10, one from each of the 10 regions of the Astronomical League. And we always, we always like to thank our volunteers. Uh, without their help, without their efforts, uh, we could, Astronomical League would not be the organization that it is today. That's very true. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I that's what makes it a great thing. organization, too. <laughs> okay, that's, that's what I have. Awesome. Okay, folks, uh, we are going to take a, we are going to take a 10 minute break, and then we're going to come back. Uh, we have a lot more uh, to cover. Uh, we'll be coming back with um, uh, Dr. Daniel Barth, and then uh, on to uh, uh, the vast reaches. So stay tuned here on the Global Star Party. Those beautiful artwork, Carlos. Oh, Carlos, you're on mute. Uh, no, the video says it's on. Uh, I was on mute audio wise, but uh, can you do you see me logged in? Okay. We see you on there on the Zoom, Doug, but no video. Is my audio working any better than earlier? It sounds better than before. 
does it? Okay. I won't touch nothing now. I'll just I'll just try to speak as loud as possible. Yeah, if you if you speak a little louder, it, it's it, it'll be fine. It should be okay. Okay, I just you know I mean I'm I'm out in the field, so it, it's kind of difficult doing everything and trying to get a keep a connection and everything else. I'm out on a out on a farm in the middle. There's no power around. I have a generator about a hundred feet away running power for myself right now. Yeah, we can see you now, Doug. Okay, good. Can you hear me okay? Can hear you. Yep. Okay. I got to I got to bring up everything I was talking about before. I closed it all out to restart. Yes.
You have clear skies out there, Doug? Yeah, actually it's going pretty good. Good. So we're going to go, um, we're going to visit with uh, Daniel Barth. We'll do Jason Genzel, and then we go to Doug Struble. Oh, Jason, yeah. Yeah. We're uh, really close friends. I don't know if you know that. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, that's great. We actually live pretty close to each other, too. So. <laughs> oh, you can hear me. Yeah, guys, you all, and you got Chuck Ayub out there really close by. So it's like, yeah. It's, uh, this epicenter of incredible astrophotographers. <laughs> yeah. It's awesome. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not sure why my webcam was having a problem. I had to restart. Yeah, sometimes just needs to handshake better. Yeah. Well, that doesn't look good. Then we have Rodrigo Zaleda. I think we might also have Opeka is in Stockholm. So these guys are up late. Um, and uh, we've got, uh, I think we might have Cesar as well. I thought I saw something. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. I'm actually working on a live image here. I started right when we started this broadcast. So. Oh, very cool. What did you decide to do, Jason? M81. Okay. Not to ruin the surprise. Because <laughs> I think we're broadcasting. <laughs> okay, here we go. All right. Let's, uh, um, we're all back. Uh, thank you for uh you know uh taking that pause with us um we have uh more people who've logged on cesar brolo from argentina's on with us and and uh doug struble is uh is, a, is on with us as well we are going to um uh segue to dr daniel barth uh he is a, a uh he is a longtime friend of mine um and uh you know comrade in, uh, in the telescope industry as well, but uh, he became an educator, um, I think following his lifelong dream. And uh, he is a major influence in uh, science outreach here, not only in the state of Arkansas, but nationally as well. And um, uh, he, starting on Monday, he is going to have his own program uh, showing um, uh, astronomical STEM uh, activities that people can do to not only uh, uh, teach uh, youngsters or, or to teach educators uh, how, to, um, how to educate others about how uh, the universe works, but uh, uh, to, to discover things about it yourself. So uh, to, like to prove to yourself that uh, not just because you have read it somewhere or somebody told you that the moon is round, uh, how do you really, really know? And so th these are the kind of conversations I have with uh, Daniel Barth. So anyways, Daniel, I'm going to give you the stage. Well, thank you. Uh, nice to be here, Scott. And uh, one of the, the things for those of you who don't know me, uh, my program is called Astronomy for Educators. And uh, uh, we're now in uh, about 42 different countries, uh, about 3,700 schools around the world are using the program. The whole idea that I've fought against all my life is that teaching astronomy has to be expensive, difficult, and require big, pricey equipment. It's just not so. Um, I had a teacher recently ask me, hey, Doc, you know, um, I want to show my students about uh, Earth and Mars and the moon, and I, I want to model this in my classroom, but it, it's, it's so expensive. I've looked up things online, and I said, no, 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 that's, that's not hard. I said, um, you know, go ahead and start with, with a baseball. Here's your earth. And if this uh, four inch baseball is your earth, then uh, here's your two inch ping pong ball. It's, it's lovely decorated here by one of my students to look like Mars. 
And if this is Mars, what's the moon? Well, the moon would be a, a one inch marble. And so you can put a model of Earth, the moon and Mars into students' hands for a, a couple of dollars. And you can really show them, oh, okay, why is Mars gravity, you know, one third of what the Earth is? Well, look at the relative size of the planet. And we can talk about gravity and other things. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share a screen for you. One of the interesting things that I do is we take a look at, uh, how do you know? We start students out and we say, okay, uh, go look at the moon tonight. And let's say the moon is at, uh, right now we're just about at quarter phase. So the moon is half lit. So here you go, predict in ink, please, what you think the moon is going to look like in the next few days, and then go out and see if you're right. Uh, the idea, we think we know things. And so we take students along and we say, okay, well, let's, now that we've looked at the moon for uh, a few days here and we've looked at the phases, let's go ahead and make a model of this. And we have this lovely uh, little salt dough model that one of my students made. And I said, oh, great. So now you know that what happens next. And they said, oh, yes, well, we can see here if we're, we're waxing and we're at the quarter phase, we're going to go to gibbous and then we're going to go to full and then back around again. And I say, oh, that's great. So you know what happens next. And the students say, yes, we do. And then I ask what I like to call the clock stopper question. How does it work? And the kids are like, but I just figured out what happens next. I go, yeah, okay, science is like that. You can't rest on your laurels. You know what happens next. How is it working? And so at this point we say, well, is the moon really flat? And kids will say, no. Well, what shape is it? Well, it's round. I'm like, round like <coughs> a disc plate? And they'll go, no, no, no. It's round like a ball. How do you know? Well, you know? the problem is that uh, science, the way it's been taught for the last half century is learn, believe, repeat, right? Learn this, believe it because I said, told you so. It's in the book, right? It's on the internet. <laughs> and now repeat it on a test. Now you're smart. And if you think about that, learn, believe, repeat model of standards-based education, and now you're smart. Now you belong to a good school. It's just silly. And so I say, well, okay, well, if you're smart, how does it work? And I say, well, okay, well, if we're going to figure that out, let's go away from modeling the moon as flat. Let's model the moon as round. And so we need something really big and expensive for this. Let's get some ping pong balls and uh, we can go ahead and we can model the earth. And I think I've got a little model here. And it, it, this, is, this is one my students did and it's very nice. And it has North and South America and the Atlantic and the Pacific. And gee, the other, that's, that's night, the dark side. That's... <laughs> That's where night is. And you go, okay, so we've got this round model. Can we figure out how the phases work? And then we start putting the moon on the table and we start running it around. And I get the kids to take out their cell phones and they take pictures and they make a GIF and they say, oh my God, the phase has changed because the moon rotates. Yes. But how about if you step away from your table and observe from over? Oh, it doesn't work from over there. I'm like, oh, yes. So our privileged position on the Earth, looking out from the center of the moon's orbit and the sun, that's what gives us phases. Well, can you expand this model? Yes, sure you can. Here's, here's the sun and Venus and Mars and Earth and the moon. And you can actually use this five ping pong ball set and you can prove as Galileo did, the sun has to be in the center. Because those of us who go out and observe, we know, oh, Venus has phases. Well, how does it work? Well, it turns out unless you put the sun in the center, it doesn't. You can try to put the earth in the center the way, you know, the Pope used to say, oh, and Aristotle used to say, a geocentric system. You can't get phases out of inferior planets and disks out of superior planets if the earth is in the middle. It doesn't work. And so, oh, okay, we can do this. Well, what about the moon, teachers say? I want to talk about the moon. I want to talk about planetary surfaces. And gee, that's so hard. I can't do that. I'm like, do you have a pound of clay? Do you have a pound? Can you make some salt dough? That's like 10 cents of flour and some water and some salt. And can you model a surface of the moon? Now, this isn't, people ask me, all, oh, is, is that a particular place on the moon? I'm like, no, of course it's not. It's just like, you know, this isn't really, you know, Mars. It's just something decorated to look kind of like Mars. 
the art isn't important. Students, they spend some time in my class and they go, okay, let's, let's make this model of the moon. And we start with a big depression and we put some dark clay. That's a Mario, oh, the dark clay is lava. And then, oh, but Mario are really old. So there've been other impacts on top of them. So we see other craters and we see that, oh, some, some craters are new and they have little mountains in there and what makes those with a little pinch of clay. And some are really new. So we have these splatter marks we call rays. And then we, oh, notice how these mountains, they, they form around this Maria. Why? They're not made by plate tectonics. The moon has mountains in a minute. It's like instant mac and cheese. You get an asteroid, it hits, kaboom! And mountain-sized pieces fall down like splatters around the rim of the Maria. And you get these lovely mountain chains that are formed not over millions of years by plate tectonics, but like that, boom, here's a mountain. What's wonderful is you spend some time modeling the moon's surface. And then you say, okay, well, let's, let's make a map. Let's take a pizza cutter and go ahead and put lines of latitude and longitude in here. Let's make a map. Well, if we make a map, can we use Pythagorean theorem and find distances? Can we use some pins in our clay model and run string around and find perimeters and areas? And yes, we can do all these things, but what's the value? The value comes when we take people out to see the moon through a telescope. We were talking, Scott and I were talking about this the other day. I've, I've been to many, many places doing outreach and you set up this lovely telescope. Here we are. And people will come up and they'll put their eye and you get one of two reactions. You get the first reaction, the reaction why, oh, wow, it's the moon, oh my God. There's craters, oh look at the dark spots, the light spots, oh. And people are just agog with the experience. It hits them literally like a pie in the face and they are agog. The other reaction, the one we don't like so much is somebody comes up and they go and they look in the eyepiece and they go, oh yeah, it's the moon, I've seen it. And you go, what? Have you used a nice telescope like this? Look, I've had this 120 millimeter refractor and have you, have you seen a telescope this big? Well, no, but it's the moon, I've seen it. And they'll inevitably hold up their fondle slab, right? Their little smartphone and they'll say, oh yeah, well, you sit back and you think, how many images do people see every day? Especially since we all carry around our little screen everywhere. We see thousands of images every day. So for those of us who want to teach astronomy, whether it's casually, uh, you know, if you're one of these guys like me, I take my telescope out in my front yard on Halloween and I put a bowl of candy under it and little kids come up. Wow, is that a telescope? Yeah, you're brave enough to look at the moon. Okay. Oh, you're so brave. You get a piece of candy. And then bigger kids come up and go, oh, dude, can I see your telescope? I'm like, sure. Look at the moon cost you one candy bar. Put it in the bowl. I don't buy any candy. <laughs> I recycle it from the older kids to the younger kids. Well, the thing is, if you spend some time and you have children, students, people of any age, and they play with clay and they model the moon, when they go to the telescope, they're bringing knowledge to it. They yes. look in the telescope and then they say, oh, wait, I know what that is. That's Amari. Isn't that dark spot? Isn't that all lava? Yes, it is. Can you see the mountains? Around? I see them. Oh, my gosh, there's the shadows. And uh, we see all these crazy things and, and people go, oh, my God, it's amazing. When they bring a little bit of knowledge to the eyepiece, the experience that they take away is far richer. And we don't have to spend lots of money or buy expensive equipment from fancy catalogs. I'm kind of on a crusade against that. You know where I got this? I, I spent 36 years teaching astronomy in California, mostly in places where I had no money. And people would say, oh, I'd say, oh, can I, can I buy this model of the Earth and Moon and look, it spins around? How much does it cost? $600. Well, we could never afford that. You can buy it if you want to. Well, I don't have $600. So I had to go back and I had to figure out, how do you make it yourself? How do you make it for cheap? Can you do it for a dollar? You know, it sounds like a grouch of Marx if you're that old. It sounds, can you do it for a dollar? And, <laughs> yes, I can do it. I can do it for a dollar. And I, I don't have the cigar. So you get deeper into the moons and you say, well, gee, why is there a tide on the opposite side of the moon? And I have, I have this, uh, this lovely photo, and I don't know if I, I can find it for you in a second here, but I have this, this lovely photo. And somebody said, well, how, how, do you, uh, how do you explain that there's, uh, 
a tide on the opposite side of the moon. And I said, well, here you go. I said, it, it's very easy. All you have to do is you have to go ahead and take a cup of water and go outside and yank the cup out from underneath the water. And they're like, what? I said, go hold up a cup of water and yank the cup down. My wife very, very nicely came out to our driveway and we spent about half an hour. Wait, I need another cup of water. And she said, well, how are you going to explain this to kids for, for cheap? And I said, well, that's not hard. That's not hard because all I have to do is I have a, a baseball and I tape a fishing weight. And this is a piece of elastic from an old uh, COVID mask. And you just go ahead and if you yank the ball up and what you see is the weight underneath lags behind, there's inertia. So on the side nearest the moon, gravity dominates and the waters are pulled toward the moon. But on the far side, the earth is actually being pulled out of place. The water lags behind and inertia dominates. So you get a tide on both sides. And oh, gee, if the moon comes too close, what happens there? Well, we have something called the Roche limit. Gravity pulls on one side of the moon is closer to the planet than the other. The moon is stretched and essentially torn apart. And well, that's, that's terribly hard math. You can't explain that to kids, certainly not fifth. I said, yes, you can, just watch me. You know, it's kind of, I was a stubborn kid. I said, shut up, just watch me. It was kind of the uh, teenage version of hold my beer. So I said, okay, here's what you do. You take a lump of clay. You say, how skinny a string can you get where a 30 centimeter piece will be able to support its own weight without parting? And you keep rolling it out on a piece of wax paper and you roll out skinnier, skinnier. And you finally get to a piece where 30 centimeters, it just weighs too much and it won't support its own weight anymore. That's the Roche effect right there. Mm -hmm. When gravity becomes stronger than the cohesive forces that hold the material together then it parts and you get this lovely, lovely ring around Saturn. We think now that the inner moon of Mars, Phobos, we think the inner moon of Mars, which is spiraling into the planet, has crossed the Roche limit and been shredded and then reassembled many times over history. About every 200 million years, it should shred and then reassemble. It's like wash, rinse, repeat. You know, I went through a whole bottle of shampoo one time before I figured out you're not supposed to just keep doing that. Mars hasn't figured that out yet. It keeps on destroying this moon. We want to try to prove this. The Japanese are sending a mission called Mars Moon Explorer, the MMX. They hope to get samples of Phobos. If it's a captured asteroid, the way some people say, it should be three to four billion years old. But if it's actually this cyclic shred and reassemble moon, you know, like Lego toys, then it should only be about a couple hundred million years old. And that should be easy to tell from a sample. But the wonderful thing is that astronomy doesn't have to be expensive. It doesn't have to be hard. It can be taught to any level of student, about third grade on up. And you can add in the math once you have the concept of, oh, Roche limit is this string of clay and eventually it tears apart under its own weight. You can add the math and the math makes sense. How many of us ever went into a math class where Johnny has three X minus seven friends and two Z plus five apples. And you're wondering who the hell is Johnny and why does he talk like this? But on the other hand, if you play with a ball of string, a ball of clay, make a string of clay and you find it parts and you go, oh, it won't hold up its own weight. And you go, oh yeah. No matter what it's made of, titanium, if you had a long enough reel in a helicopter, aren't you going to spool out enough where it'll rip? Well, sure. Once you do that, then you go ahead and add the math. And all of a sudden, the math is about something you've seen already. The math is about an experience you've already had. And you know what else is neat about the little models? I found this out teaching in California, where most of the kids in my classes in the low desert, they didn't speak English at home the way I did. Every child built that model in their own language in their head. My job was to help them learn enough STEM vocabulary to express what they knew because every student at every age is smarter than they can express. And as teachers, that's one of our biggest challenges. Haven't we all had a test where they go, oh, dang it, if they would have asked that question, I would have got a better score because I knew that, I just didn't know this. Our challenge is to give children the tools to express what we've helped them learn 
And if we're saying, here's a mindless sheet of vocabulary, learn this, words mean other words. On the other hand, if we say, oh, gee, hey, uh, make yourself a clay model of the moon. Now go ahead and take your smartphone flashlight and move it over the top and see the shadows change, just like the phases do on the moon. And now they've had an experience. Now you say, let's learn how to express what we know. That's the entire idea behind the Astronomy for Educators program. And anyone who's interested can, can go into Google and put in Astronomy for Educators, Daniel E. Barth. It'll come right up for you. And yeah. uh, I gave the book away. Uh, the University of Arkansas Library Press publishes it. Anyone can have a copy for free. And uh, if you're out I've, there- if I've, you already put the link this, up. I've already put the link up you, for Scott, you. So it's in the chat right now. Um, and Scott and I said, you know, we got to do, we got to do a show. We got to do a, how do you know show? And we got to stop the clock. We got to stop the learn, believe, repeat cycle. And we've got to get teachers with students and say, you know what? Put down the worksheet, turn off the smartphone and pick up some clay, uh, pick up some ping pong balls and some markers. Let's create some astronomy. And once we have an experience, then we can go outside in the night sky and we can make observations and we can link what the universe gives us to what the classroom experience gives us. And making it cheap means that it's accessible everywhere to everyone. There's no financial barrier to enjoying the universe. And that's the beauty of it. And that's my mission and Scott, Thanks Thank so much, Val, for giving me uh, my, my flight. Yeah, thanks very my much. Here. <laughs> I love it when he comes on. Uh, Daniel's uh, not only a, a, a brilliant educator, but uh, he's very entertaining. And, uh, and that's, that, that comes from you. Lots of time in front of students and trying to get the message across. So that's very cool. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. Okay, well, next up is... Um, uh, the one and only, the vast reaches, uh, Jason Genzel. And uh, Jason, uh, I think uh, you gave it away that you already have uh, some live uh, images coming through your telescope. Is that right? Yeah, that's right, Scott. Thanks for having me on. Um, I, I did uh, join in today trying to do some live imaging. Tried to pick a bright target. Um, we're going to transition from... Um, you know, the, the last topic being a simplified uh, ways to think about the universe in a simplified way to a kind of complex process of astro imaging. But yeah, I'll try to walk you through it. I, I just thought it'd be interesting to show kind of uh, what we go through, you know, imaging the night sky. And, and uh, so I've got um, the Galaxy M81 um, in the sights of my telescope. So I'll Share my screen here. You can see that. Is my screen being shared? Looks like it. I'm on two separate computers here, so I'm looking back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, it's coming. We see the moon right now. That is distinctly the moon. Yeah. Um, all right. So this uh, this software here is uh, Sequence Generator Pro. Are you able to see this here? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. So what I have here is then um, live images coming in of the M81 galaxy, and this is shot with a monochrome camera, so you're not going to see color in these live images. But um, right now, I'm shooting a luminance frame, which is essentially uh, a clear filter, except for the infrared and the ultraviolet light are trimmed off of the the um, the uh, result, but what you're essentially seeing then is all the, the brightness information coming through in the image. So this is the M81 galaxy here, and I can dim it down a little bit so you can kind of see, um, even in a sing, single sub sub exposure, you can see, you know, kind of the, the spiral arms of the galaxy and the dust lanes coming through here. Um, so I started imaging this in, at the beginning of the program. So it's been, about two hours. Um, and I, a little while ago, I pulled off um, some data and I, and I stacked it so we could take a look at the galaxy, uh, how it looks um, as you integrate the, the subs that are coming off of the camera. So I shot this 
as I said, with the monochrome camera, I shot a, a red, green, and blue images, five sub exposures of two minutes each, so 10 minutes per channel. Mm -hmm. So I've got a half hour of color data, and then I've been uh, acquiring the luminance data uh, currently. And so let's hop over here into Pixin site. All right, can you see that? Yes. Yeah, so this is what the galaxy looks like after we take those sub exposures and combine them. So this is um, after 12 minutes of data here on the right. And then on the left, this is 25 and a half minutes of data. So it's almost double, double the exposure time. This gives you a good look at what happens when we, you know, why we shoot long exposures because um, as you, add exposure to the image, it essentially starts dropping the noise level and, and then it allows you to stretch the data more, which is to, you know, to look at the, the differences in brightness and you can see more of the galaxy structure start popping up. So if you can, you know, notice on the, on the left-hand side that the brightness of the image is increased, it's because you know, we're able to look at more of the tonality of the image and then the, the spiral arms start uh, yes. you know, becoming oh, yeah. more evident there. And also the, the uh, dust lanes within. So if we zoom in a little bit, you, know, you can start to see the star forming rate regions of the arms uh, yeah. popping out here um, and, and then some of the dust lanes. And so I've taken that and I combine it with the uh, color data, which this, this is the stack of the color data combined. Uh, so you can start to see some of the, the, uh, the, the colors in the, in the galaxy. And so if I combine the luminance data then with the RGB, which is the color information, uh, pops out to this image. So then you can really start to see the you know, the uh, warm glow of the, the galactic core there, along with the magenta hues of the, the uh, hydrogen alpha regions, which are the star forming rate regions out in the arms. And then the, uh, the blue tint of the supergiant stars out here in the, in the arms themselves. So I thought this is a kind of a good demonstration of about an hour's worth of imaging, but how, how an image it comes together. I don't know if there's any questions on this. This is just a lightning fast demo. They're all kind of standing there with their jaws, you know, dropped. Go through. <laughs> so in a typical image like this, I will gather probably in excess of 10 hours of luminance data and then, uh, you know, a few hours of, of each RGB. And once you add that time, you, you can kind of see here from this little demonstration, you know, what, what doubling the integration time does. As you keep doubling that, you keep uh, lowering the noise in, in the background information and being able to pull out fainter and fainter, fainter details. So it's a crash course in the process. But um, yeah, I mean, a pretty cool look overall. Um, definitely a lot more than you can see you know, in the eyepiece, which is, you know, one of the reasons why I'm drawn to astrophotography is I just want to see those little faint bits that, that are hard to see visually. Very good. So outside of that, I mean, I have a couple other images I could show. Um, I've been doing some, some new solar work and also some, some galaxy work. I can show off a galaxy um, now you're going to see the solar image first as soon as I open this up. So we'll talk about that. This is one of the recent solar images I took. This is the uh, sun with the hydrogen alpha solar filter behind the um, my favorite solar telescope, which is the Explore Scientific AR-152. Oh, wow. uh, it really gets you in there close to see some details. This is active region. 2804, which was on the sun about a week ago. And there's a, there's a sunspot here, um, along with some other, you know, activity in that region. I've, I've been working out a new process to kind of show off the, uh, the details in the solar 
chromosphere with a lot of uh, contrast enhancements. So this is kind of a new deal I'm working through. Seems to get a pretty Beautiful. good response out of people. Beautiful. And also, um, where is it? Oh yeah, this, this is a, the Phantom Galaxy M74. And it's just an example of what happens when you when you take a you know a, a ton of luminance data and, and then stack it with RGB and saturate it as I like to do and and you know pull out all the faint faint details. So there's a, you know quite a lot of information down here in the in the core of the galaxy along with the, uh, the faint arms of the, of the galaxy itself. So, you know, you start looking through and there's, you know, just tons of background galaxies, little edge on spirals and faint fuzzies out here. Uh, you know, little tiny spiral galaxies out in the distance. Some of these galaxies are on the order of 10 times further away from us than M74, which is I think around somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 60 million light years away from us. Beautiful. I just love that. It looks electric to me. It's incredible. Yeah, and then I'll, I'll show one other solar image here. This is a, a well, that's really close up. <laughs> this is a close up of, the, of a sunspot that was, uh, I think, shot at the end of November last year. But this is, uh, you know, zoomed in to get as much uh, detail as I can get out of this sunspot. I was really happy with this result too. And again, this is with the Daystar Quark solar filter behind the AR-152, the six inch Acromat telescope. Wow. I gotta get me one of those. <laughs> yeah. The results are amazing. And you know, I've shot, there's, I'm not gonna lie, the, the results in narrow band out of that telescope are amazing too. I think I have one of them. I love that. Yeah, this this lobster claw, that's really zoomed in. This was shot again with the AR-152 telescope uh, in narrow band. So this is just in uh, hydrogen alpha and oxygen wavelengths. Spectacular. What I've seen cool it before, but I never yeah. get tired of looking at it. It's beautiful. Beautiful. This is uh, another, did I, show, I don't know if I showed this one here. I apologize if this is a repeat, but this is, this is a pretty cool galaxy I imaged at the beginning of the year. This is NGC 660, which is a polar ring galaxy. Polar ring galaxies are unique because they, um, they're actually theorized to be caused by the merger between two galaxies, like a, a lenticular type, um, basically, capturing a satellite galaxy and stringing the, that um, captured galaxy out into a ring around, around the, the uh, progenitor galaxy. But the, the, uh, the cool thing is, is they, they normally um, call polar galaxies because those, those remnants orbit the poles of the the uh, central galaxy, but in this case, it's uh, canted almost at 45 degrees. Yeah. Um, and the, it's a really active ring. Uh, it's got, you know, the bright blue supergiant stars and the hydrogen alpha star forming regions and some pretty dark dust lanes. If you see, you know, it silhouetted against the, the main galaxy, it's it's got a lot of dusty material in there too. So it was a rather sizable galaxy that was captured there and, and uh, basically ripped apart and strung around this uh, central Beautiful. galaxy. That's gorgeous. And again, there's, you know, the distant galaxies visible out here. This is a nice edge on spiral. Oh, it reminds me a little bit of the needle galaxy. Oh, that's beautiful. And then this smudge, which is just a weird thing. I don't even know what to call this. It's, yeah. it's got almost no structure to it, but it's got is that you know, some hydrogen alpha blobs in yeah. it. Oh, wow. Wow. 
I think you're inspiring a lot of viewers right now. It's really cool. Well, good. So awesome. oh. <laughs> I don't know if there's any questions. I didn't look at you know the chat or anything. I think they're all blown away. Uh, no, I comments like beauty, beautiful, incredible. You know, so it's good. Awesome. I ordered awesome. a uh, AR-127 a few weeks ago, simply because some of the images you've taken, Jason, they're just amazing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, thanks. I mean, those, those scopes are great. Um, you know, you, you got to be conscious of how you use them. They're not necessarily designed for, for imaging. Um, you've got some issues to contend with, with uh, color correction, which can really be addressed with, you know, using narrow band filters, uh, be it for the, the solar imaging or for deep sky. I mean, they really produce good results. Uh, bang for the buck for sure. Oh, okay. That's what I got. So um, I'm going to keep on marching along with uh, M81 and, and uh, hope to you know get that a little bit more clear maybe next time around. But um, if anybody wants to see any of my work, you can find me, uh, you know, Scott mentioned the vast, vast reaches, but pretty much on all the social media channels, that's what I use as my username and just all one word, the vast reaches. Awesome. Thanks, for, thanks for having me on, Scott. Thank you. Good Lord. Thank you very much. Okay. So we're, we're, we're going through some astrophotographers now. Uh, up next will be uh, Doug Struble, who's just, I guess, down the street from Jason Gonzell, <laughs> so, <laughs> and just down the street from uh, from Chuck Ayub, who's been watching the program tonight. So, uh, uh, Doug, I, I will, uh, I'll, I'll let you have the uh, the stage here. I'm uh, sharing my desktop screen right now. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Share screen. Okay, hold on one second. It wants me to grant permission to share the screen. Go ahead. You should be able to do that. Yeah. Just be a second here. I'd like to call your attention to Space Kitty while uh, Space Kitty. While he's working on that. <laughs> <laughs> this is Orion, and he's uh, floating in space on my he green screen. Floating in space. <laughs> How does he do that? Yeah. <laughs> He is Space Kitty. Yeah. <laughs> he floats in space. Are you able to um, to share your screen there, Doug? Did we lose him? Okay, I think I got it. Okay, good. There okay. we go. Yeah. So you can see my screen? See your screen. Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I basically want to talk about astrophotography when it comes to a major, you know, red, white zone, what have you. Um, 
So first of all, um, I'm working on two projects right now. One is Sharpless 224, which is a uh, planetary nebula, which I'm doing in hydrogen and oxygen. And then the other one I'm working on right now is um, ABLE 30, which is uh, a small planetary nebula. Uh, and that one is mostly in, in mostly in oxygen. Um, there's a lot of misconceptions when it comes to doing astrophotography. Can you hear me okay? Are you just fine? Yep. Okay. So um, one of the biggest things is people think that you need to be in a dark area to do astrophotography. And that's not true at all. It used to be maybe back in the 90s or 80s and before. Um, but with the capabilities of doing narrow narrow band astrophotography, um, you could do a lot more within the city limits. Um, like Chuck, I'm uh, 15 minutes from the Detroit area. And um, back in 2016, I, I uh, well, I guess I've always wanted to do astrophotography all my life. I've loved astronomy as a kid, but I knew to do it right and to do it where I was at would require, you know, amount of investment and patience. And, and, and uh, back in 2016, a, um, a drunk driver told my car in my driveway, mm -hmm. it was a performance challenger and I got a payout settlement for like over 20,000, uh, which I started you know, thinking to myself, well, if I'm going to get into astrophotography, I got a, a good substantial investment to do it now. And so I, I made my initial investment. And then once I started getting into it, I realized that patience is the number one investment needed to do astrophotography within city limits. So I started building an observatory. It's just a slide off roof. It's nothing too crazy. Um, but I started building it in my backyard and, um, as a result, I have two rigs running. Uh, my primary rig is a 165 millimeter, um, explore scientific, uh, APO. And then I have a stellar view, uh, 102 millimeter on my second rig. And then I have two laptops, uh, that control each one. Uh, that I monitor from inside my house using TeamViewer um, in my studio. Wow. And the dog uh, guards your equipment? Uh, they're huskies. They don't make for very good dark guard dogs. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. They're, uh, they're kind of funny that way. So, no yeah, way. These, these are my two main rigs right here. Um, yeah. I, I have my Explorer Scientific sitting on a, 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 a Astro. Uh, physics Mach 1. Wow, beautiful. Yeah, and uh, the focal length is around 12, or it's actually 1156 millimeters, which is, which does me pretty well. Um, I like to get a little bit more focal length, uh, maybe a bigger, even bigger APO some down, down the road. Uh, but for the time being, um, it does really well. Um, so getting back to doing astrophotography in a uh, light polluted area being 15 minutes from Detroit just like Chuck is and then um, uh, Jason who just talked before me he's uh, about maybe 45 minutes from me um, and Jason has actually been a, a wealth of information I had to uh, I had to do some soul searching and, and digging when it came to doing astrophotography, but um, even broadband can be done um, in this area as well, too. This is my M1, M51 I did a couple of years ago. Um, but if you were to look at w what it took to do that, um, I had 50 hours involved. Uh, so when you're doing astrophotography in a major light polluted area, you got to really pile on the integration time in order to pull that signal out above the noise floor. Um, and that's 
kind of what I do. So like, it's like one of those things like, you know, a watch pot never boils. That's kind of what I have to do here. So mm -hmm. a, a lot of the time when I have my, um, my rigs going, um, I'm working on actual work myself. I'm independently employed. I, I, I produce advertising production to TV commercials, stuff like that. Um, so I'll work on that kind of stuff while it's kind of going, you know, in the background. Um, and then, you know, um, when you really pile on those hours, you can get that, that signal to really pop up through the noise. Uh, but for the most part, I do a lot of broadband stuff. Uh, this is the latest image I just did recently of the M1 Crab Nebula. Um, and as you can see, there is a, a part of uh, oxygen being ejected from the core, uh, which is not really picked up in broadband a lot. So it gives me some capabilities of doing some things that maybe aren't often captured in a certain type of palette. Um, I, I, I tend to do a lot of hydrogen alpha and oxygen pallets with, and then I'll include like, you know, some RGB stars uh, to give it some color uh, in there as well. Um, I, I don't know, this is the first time presenting. I, I'm not really sure how you take questions, but I would really love to help people out that are living in a heavy light, light fluid area yeah. uh, to give them some direction on what could really help them uh, produce, you know, some really nice images. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I guess when it comes to broadband, I do really short exposures, like around 60 seconds a piece uh, at zero gain. Um, otherwise, the, the histogram uh, tends to move far to the right and you tend to overwhelm the, uh, the, the camera sensor itself. So, uh, I do really sort of short exposures, even with narrow band, I tend to do only two minute exposures with 200 gain. So it really eats up a lot of hard drive space, but you know, it, uh, it really helps, you know, compiling the data together, uh, bringing out the signal. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately I'm able to produce some really, some really cool things, uh, that can't normally be done around this area. Right. I had a question. I had a question, Doug, about your uh, strategy for storage. Do you do you get rid of your raw data after a while? I mean, or do you just keep buying hard drives to store your raw data? So I have a NAS unit. It's a forty-eight terabyte uh, network attack storage. That's yeah, that's pretty big. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm I'm fortunate enough where I can write it off because. I own a production company, advertising production company too. So I use that for both work and astrophotography. Um, so I have, I have two, um, I have two Mac desktops. One is a newer one that just came out last year. It's a 16 um, core system. And then my other one's a 12 core system from a few years ago. And I run both of them a lot to uh, process the data. And they're both attached um, via 10 gigabit switch uh, to a, a NAS uh, network drive. Yeah, beautiful. I have a question too. Have you ever used, being that you're in advertising media, um, have you ever used any of your astrophotography in your advertising programs? I have not. I have not found a purpose for it, uh, specifically for that, no. Um, I've been featured in a lot of magazines, uh, BBC Sky at Night, Sky and Telescope, Astronomy Magazine, uh, APOD, and, and so forth. Yeah. Uh, but in terms of this meeting, what I actually do for a living, there's been no crossover. I see. Aside from the, aside from the equipment, you know. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and out of all the images that you've made, I mean, uh, what do you, what do you consider to be like your top three? Um, this one was one of my favorite, the flaming skull planetary nebula. Um, I think I had probably around, yeah, it's 36.4 hours between hydrogen alpha and oxygen. 
Um, but one of my favorite ones I did was, uh, where is it at here? Um, this one is part of a, this is part of a super giant or a supernova giant, uh, Sharpless 96. And, um, I did this one, um, probably about a year ago. Yeah. Look at that. Um, like lace work. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Or God, it's, it's incredible. Um, I, I think, you know, I have a lot, I have a lot more, um, I guess success when it comes to APOs, uh, mm -hmm. refractors. Um, I, I've had a, a 10 inch, uh, RC, I've had a Smith Castle Grain, um, I've had a 12-inch Newt. Um, I have a lot of reflectivity problems because of the light pollution here. Um, once I get below 40 degrees, um, it, it starts to overwhelm the telescope. Um, and I don't have that problem with APOs as much. Um, so I, I tend to use a lot of refractors uh, more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, one of my favorite ones I did was, it's, uh, where's that? This one right here. It's a uh, Wolf Ryan, uh, WR-134. Yeah. And, um, this one is not really captured that often with the full disc, circular disc of the auction data. Um, and so... I really try to pile it on, That's you know, good. That. Um, I guess with that, I mean, I would like to take some questions. I don't know if there's any questions about people who are having a hard time uh, with a light polluted area. Yeah, we, I don't, I don't see any questions yet in the chat, but um, uh, what is, uh, obviously this is going to get the gears turning uh, with people. Uh, uh, you know, I agree with you about, um, you know, that uh, you can do amazing. I mean, obviously, you can do amazing stuff, even in a light polluted sky. Uh, uh, Jerry Hubble and I have had uh, a lot of programs, uh, and Kent Martz and I as well, where we, we talk to the audience about uh, trying to do as much astronomy as they can from their own backyards, you know, uh, because yeah. it's, 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 it's time in, you know. That makes you the better astronomer and if you're waiting to go to a really dark site or you or, you know you're waiting for conditions to be perfect or these kinds of things uh you don't get as much time in uh uh to you know get the experience level that you need uh to make you know what jerry hubble and i talk about making the equipment disappear you know because you want to have it all working so well that you don't really have to th think about the gear too much, you know, and so, um, and you can concentrate on gathering the data and doing all the rest of it uh, that you need to do to do amazing work like you're doing. So um, I, uh, you know, I'm stunned uh, by, by the quality of your work and, uh, um, you know, always love uh, seeing uh, images come from you. Recently, you showed us a Crab Nebula shot that was like, 31 hours and change, uh, also an amazing image. So, yeah, I mean, I think the biggest thing, you know, to take away when it comes to doing astrophotography with the light polluted area is that, um, uh, when it comes to obviously narrow bands, you know, it's going to be easier to do. Um, it levels the playing field. Um, when you get into narrow band, the band pass, you know, of each narrow band filter, you know, like a, a seven or six is really good for hydrogen, alpha and sulfur. But when it comes to oxygen, um, you really need a shorter band pass, like around three NM uh, to do oxygen because of the light pollution, how it affects oxygen, uh, especially with the moon. So like with the moon, I can go up to about 80% of the moon within mm -hmm. 30 degrees of the moon at 80% and still have good, good data, you know, good signal to racial, uh, good signal to noise ratio anyways. Um, 
and um, that's kind of like a rule of thumb for me. So um, uh, my oxygen filters I use on both rigs are Astrodon 3NM. And I realized that, you know, Astrodon, you know, they got sold off and they're not really doing well, you know. Uh, I think Chroma might offer a 3NM filter, but I'm not exactly sure. Uh, so, so on both rigs. Thank I'm, you. I have the 3 nanometer hydrogen and oxygen filters from Chroma. And um, on my Schmidt Cassegrain at F6.3, so far they've worked really well. Um, I haven't tried them at F5 yet, but I expect that they'll work well at F5 as well. Um, yeah, been really good so far. Is there a reason why you went to 3NM on HA and, and Sulfur? I live north of San Francisco. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, like, I'm 15. The narrower, the better. <laughs> yeah, I know, exactly. I, I'm 15 minutes from Detroit, so I'm in a Boro yeah. Sky scale of 8. Um, I'm in a white zone. Yeah. And I, I find six to seven to be fine with HA and sulfur. Okay. I haven't had a problem. Uh, nice. But oxygen is the major problem for me. And that's where I use the three NM filters for those. Okay. Yeah. And the, um, uh, for Chroma, the five nanometer and the three nanometer filters are the same price. So I just went ahead and dropped the three nanometer. How uh, much, so did, how much you charge for those? Um, they were cheaper than Astrodons, but more expensive than all the other ones. I can't remember. Okay. I, don't look. I bought them like a year ago. <laughs> they just, okay. they, you know, they just doubled their prices on everything, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me, me and Jason were just talking about that the other day. It's terrible. Is that the fault of some really amazing astrophotographers driving the prices up? <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? I mean, I don't know. Oh, but, uh, yeah, well, since, since I don't use um, like Hyperstar and stuff like that, um, uh, there wasn't any reason for me to go any wider than three. Because uh, if uh, it, you probably know, know this, but for everybody else out there, if you have a fast imaging system like a, an F2 camera lens, or if you're using Hyperstar or Rasa at F2, really narrow narrowband filters can actually put you off band in those really fast systems. Yeah, um, that's what I've heard. Yeah, so I um uh so like three nanometers wouldn't be good for those systems, but I don't I um uh don't tend to image on on really fast focal ratios, so uh, the three nanometer is just going to work well for me. But I do have also the Optolong L Extreme uh, Duo narrowband filter, and that one's I think five nanometers in H alpha and seven in oxygen, um, to to grab all those oxygen lines there. Um, are you are you using that on a DSLR? I'm using that on the ZWO two nine four color camera. So yeah, I'm using that on on color. Okay, yeah, I've I've heard great things about that filter. Yeah, I'm excited. I I hit my first data set with it on the Rosette Nebula is ready to process. So I'm going to be processing that very shortly here. I'm really excited about it. Yeah, I mean the only thing I've heard is the oxygen ratio seems to be pretty low, but that's normal for the universe. So that's not really. A, a matter of the filter itself. It's a matter of, you know, just True. oxygen ratio. Yeah. 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 I'll have to see what I need to end up doing to the image to, to get the colors to balance in a pleasing way. Um, but yeah, we'll see how it turns out. The, the subframes uh, on the rosette so far look really promising. They've got a nice uh, spread of red, green, and blue. And green, the green and the blue are like right on top of each other. So I think they did a good job with the design of, of this filter going over the different color channels on the bear matrix and stuff so uh, oh good how it turns out yeah with this, with this particular image i did 21 hours of oxygen and i only did around seven hours of hydrogen so this this object seems to look very oxygen centric um but it was important to me to, to pull out that little tail um of ejected matter that's coming out from the core um so yeah, that, that is extremely cool i i I'll have to go double check and see if I picked that up in my oxygen data. I did notice in the Crab Nebula, because I also did it in, in HOO recently, that the oxygen signal does seem stronger for the same exposure time, um, which was really interesting to see. Uh, I'll have to go back and look for that stream. That's really cool. I've not seen that very often. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I've only seen it a few times, um, and that's what I was really curious about. Um, going after a broad band or a narrow band uh, is something that I can do, you know, relatively more easily here than, 
than broadband, of course. Um, like in this particular one right here, this is uh, Able 72, which is more more oxygen based. And actually, it's almost all oxygen based. Huh. Fascinating. Yeah, and uh, it's pretty small. Um, so when it comes to some of these smaller um, nebulas, I, I tend to uh, I tend to uh, remove all the stars using Starnet, and then I use Topaz Denoise uh, to help sharpen up the object itself. But I do it within each channel before I bring it into Photoshop. So I do all my pre-processing first in Pixinsight. And then I uh, go through Photoshop for the, the final processing. Yeah, I've heard, I know a lot of people who, who do it that way. Uh, I never really got good at Photoshop, <coughs> so I just do everything in Pixinsight. But uh, yeah, I see people get some incredible results by kind of mixing the two pieces of software. But I've not gotten rid of my Photoshop subscription. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's interesting. Like, I guess when I first learned Pixinsight, I. Um, I wanted to see how much I could do in Pixinsight. And then, you know, it has such a huge learning curve. And then I found myself backtracking back to Photoshop after pre-processing. So like I'll do pre-processing in Pixinsight. I'll do some, you know, uh, dynamic background extraction. I'll do, you know, some typical things, but for the most part, um, I'm, uh, you know, processing each channel independently in Photoshop and then I'll, I'll bring them in there uh, for the most part. Great. Wonderful. Doug, thanks for uh, thanks for sharing and coming on tonight. I've wanted to have you on the show for a long time, uh, but, um, you know, and I hope we can get you on again. You have a lot yeah. to share here. That's great. Yeah, I love to. I, I love to help out people where I can. Um, you know, like I said, especially when it comes to, uh, you know, doing astrophotography in a heavy light polluted area. Um, I, I wish I would have had something more, you know, I guess, dynamic, you know, presentation to show, but. Um, yeah, just mind blowing images. I mean, I, I don't know how much better it can really get. <laughs> yeah, if you want to, uh, if anybody wants to contact me, um, astrophotography by Douglas J. Struble on Facebook. And then I have an Astrobin account, you know, for. Uh, yeah. What, what is the sure. best? What is, is the Facebook account itself the best one to uh, reach you, you think? Either one's fine. Um, you know, Astrobin or on Facebook. Those are my two main things. I, I use Astrobin as a repository so I can go back and look at my integration time I spent on things. Well, Astrobin's a great, great uh, resource too. So that's pretty awesome. Uh, yeah. Um, and uh, let me see if I can just find your astrophotography by Douglas J. Struble on Facebook. I'll go ahead and pin, post that and share it in the chat. Okay, there you go. And, um, and then we've got... I went and checked the chroma filters were 750 a piece when I bought them. I have to go look. Ouch, oh order. my God, that's expensive. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, uh, if you're going to spend money on on other good components, uh, having good filters will let you actually take advantage of them <laughs> in, when you're in light polluted areas. No. But that's that's what I spent my my stimulus money on. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I agree. I mean, I I think I spent four hundred and fifty dollars per filter on Astrobin, or on uh, Astrodon filters, uh, two two or three years ago. Um, so it's amazing how much they come up in price. And, that, and that's for the, the, the price I mentioned was for the two inch size. Uh, cause I wanted to, to oh, two inch. Version. Okay. Yeah. yeah for the two yeah. inch size. Cause I want, I wanted a future proof. Cause right now I don't have a large format camera, but the odds are pretty good at some point that I will. Um, so I figured I'd go ahead and get them now as opposed to buying one and a quarter inch ones and then later buying two inch ones. <laughs> No, oh, that makes sense. Yeah, I've been thinking about doing the same. And the next set of filters I'm going to do is a two inch filter set, just in case I decide to upgrade down the road too. And I know uh, Jason uh, has been looking into two inch filters too. He just spoke before me. We're pretty good friends, live in the same area um, for the same reason. 
I, I think he just bought a new uh, Zoo APC or uh, uh, ASP size camera sensor. So, um, yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. All right. I think what we're going to do now is uh, we're going to um, transition through um, uh, Richard Grace, the Astro Beard, uh, to Molly Wakeling. Uh, Molly has a uh, presentation she'd like to give. And then after Molly, we will go on to uh, Rodrigo Zaleda in La Serena, Chile with Cesar Brolo in Argentina. And they're going to talk a little bit about uh, Southern Hemisphere astronomy. So, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and, um, and make that transition. All right. Thank you so much, Doug. It was awesome. I probably just need to say something. Oh, that's what it is. I got it now. All right. And uh, I, I want to share this because I got this in the mail. Uh, it's not uh, framed or anything yet, but uh, uh, guys at Explore Scientific. Uh, oh, yeah, that's the big print. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Yeah, very good. Awesome. Is that going right over the fireplace? Is that where? Is that the best the place? It'll be going on a wall. I got to sit it down. Sorry, I got to sit it down so it's safe. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, that's awesome. Um, I, I definitely uh, will probably lighten up uh, things too because. The only other time I've done prints, I had to uh, blow it out. So it looked like there was tons of noise on the computer screen before I uh, printed it mm -hmm. uh, in case anybody's never printed things. Um, I do have one other thing I want to share really quickly. Okay. And this is anybody who was on the European Star Party already saw this. Oh, yeah. Um, but for those who weren't, uh, last Thursday, we were looking at Orion for a little bit. And that's what came out of it. Yeah, that's nice. Very nice. Lots of uh, dynamic range there. Yeah, yeah. I think the 16-bit cam is uh, is doing its work. And uh, looking Didn't forward work. to getting some, some clear skies here. Uh, it seems like the, uh, the moon goes away, and so does the clear skies. But, yeah, uh, yeah. right on. I'm going to pass it back. All right. As soon as I find the button. There it is. There we go. And Molly, all right. it's all yours. You have the stage. All righty. Um, so I'm going to share my screen because uh, Streamlabs would not pull my camera feed today. So I've got to do this oh. the old-fashioned way. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I don't know. You do that. You you have uh, you have a Streamlab um, app or something that kind of brings you together with your uh, what you. Um, yeah, so it, it's it's easier to, to see what I can do with it when I um, so so on on University Today's virtual star party. Uh, well, and, and actually here here as well, when I, when I do actually have live telescope views, yeah. I use Streamlabs to pull together multiple uh, sources onto one screen that I can have be my, I can set that to be my, my virtual webcam and yeah. then uh, for, for Zoom and other programs. So then whatever is on my Streamlabs screen uh, will go out to whatever uh, you know, video call or, or YouTube stream or whatever. I see. So like I when I do my, uh, star party like like live live telescope views. I've got like a picture of my telescope. I have the the remote desktop app uh, yeah. uh, picture like like live feed from my backyard computer. I've got the webcam video of myself, mm -hmm. um, and it, it I, with the uh, it handles green screens and stuff. And um, uh, Zoom has its own uh, green screen detector, and it's actually working better than Streamlabs's one. So <laughs> I had to go play with the settings a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, yeah. So I, I, it, it ended up raining today, raining very hard here. So um, no live telescope views from me tonight. Uh, but I decided to throw together a quick presentation on the American Association of Variable Star Observers Variable Star of the Month, which is PROPIS. Um, the, uh, I, I'm an AAVSO ambassador, and uh, so to try and um, tell people about AAVSO and, and the kinds of uh, uh, amateur science that people can do and uh, contribute to either taking data or processing data or all kinds of stuff. Um, and also to try and recruit more people to the AAVSO, especially a wider diversity of people like women and people of color. 
So, um, and younger people in general, actually, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> yeah, so um, uh, they've teamed up with uh, Ball State University to, um, uh, to do this series on variable star of the month. So I'm gonna talk about this month's star, which is Propus, or at least that's how I'm pronouncing it. Maybe it's Propus. Um, all right, so uh, the, the catalog name is uh, Eta Geminorium. So it's the uh, whatever letter of the alphabet Eta is, uh, Eta. I've heard it pronounced both ways. I prefer Eta, but who knows? <laughs> um, uh, so it's in Gemini. It is, uh, Propus is Greek for foot. And that makes sense because it's in the foot of uh, one of the two Gemini twins. Uh, it was uh, first recorded in 1865 by German astronomer and geophysicist Julius Schmidt. Uh, he was the one who noticed that it was dimming. And it, it dims by, by 50% over the order of 234 days. So it's a, it's a long period variable, um, but a visibly noticeable, like if you're doing uh, visual observing, uh, visibly noticeable dimming, like uh, how this guy in the 1800s was able to spot. And uh, so this, this star, uh, Propus, is a red giant of the, of the M3 class, so um, up there in the spectral type. Uh, it's 2400 times uh, more, luminant than, uh, more luminous than the sun, and it's about 350 light years away, and it's in its asymptotic giant branch stage. So it's expanding and swelling and is currently estimated to be about uh, two thirds of the Earth's sun distance. So to about two thirds of an astronomical unit in diameter uh, or in radius as it were. So uh, it, its orbit would, would go out two thirds Oh my goodness, I can't talk tonight. Its size would go out to two thirds <laughs> of the distance between the sun and the Earth. Ugh, it's been a long day. Um, it lies near the ecliptic, which is also cool because that means that occasionally it gets occulted by the moon and very occasionally by some planets. Uh, it was occulted by Venus in 1910. And uh, I, I, didn't get, I didn't have enough time to look and see when the next occultation would be uh, by a planet or by the moon, but it is within that, that area that can be occulted by the moon and planets. There's actually a Navy cargo ship, the USS Propus, that is named after it. So here is a, a plot that I pulled from the AAVSO uh, variable star, or sorry, the light curve generator uh, portion of the AAVSO website, where you can go and this, this is real data contributed by, uh, by amateurs that is loaded on this website. And you can see how it varies in brightness. Now I said 50% I said dimming in magnitude if you know anything about how stellar magnitudes work, uh, that still only means a difference in brightness between uh, 3.15 and 3.9 magnitudes, but that is still a noticeable difference visually and certainly easily measurable by cameras. And uh, you, you can see uh, the, the type of variable star that it is, it's not uh, a regular variable. It's, it has a lot of irregularity in its pattern. And uh, this is because it's in that early asymptotic branch stage. Uh, basically, it's got a, uh, it's burning, it, it, hydrogen fusion has largely run out in this star and it's burning a helium shell. And that causes the star to uh, expand and, and inflate. And uh, at, at the core of the star is pretty much a, a dead core of carbon and oxygen because it's not massive enough to be able to fuse carbon and oxygen. Um, if you ever wondered where oxygen comes from in planetary nebula, uh, it's because of, of these heavier mass stars that produce oxygen in, in their later stages of life. And that's where oxygen in, in the universe comes from. Uh, so uh, because in this phase, it, it, it grows in, in, in physical size, it, it swells. And because the outer edges of it get so much further away from the main core of the star, it's gravity can't hold on to it anymore and it starts to lose its matter out into space. And this is what causes the variations in brightness. And uh, the thermal pulses can cause the star to lose more mass over periods of time. So um, that's why there's this periodicity of, of uh, less than a year. 
um, it will eventually become a more unstable Mira type star, which can have really huge dips and spikes in brightness over uh, readily measurable periods of time. And uh, some of its variability is actually due to the fact that it's also an eclipsing binary system. Every eight years, one of its companion stars passes in front of it and um, it, it brightens a bit and then dims as it goes around the back. So there's, there's a lot of different dynamics going on with this very interesting long period variable. Uh, so I mentioned it was, a, I had a, it was an eclipsing binary. This is actually a triple star system. It has a really close companion that's only seven astronomical units away. So this is called, what's called a spectroscopic binary because uh, we can't actually resolve distances that small at the distance that the star is at, uh, opti like, you know, with like a regular camera and telescope. But uh, using radial velocity, we can see that, that there's a smaller companion that's tugging at the, at the main star, Propus A. So uh, we know that there's a, a small star there. 1.4 arc seconds away from, from Propus A is another companion star, and that one you can resolve easily in, in a lot of telescopes. It's an eighth magnitude main sequence star. It lies 150 astronomical units away from Propus A and has a 700 year orbit as, as, a, as opposed to the, the nearby companions eight year orbit. And this nebulosity you can see here in this uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey image uh, is actually from the Jellyfish Nebula region, uh, IC443. Mm. Uh, so kind of a, um, nearby to a, a place that many astrophotographers have, uh, it's been a very hot target this time of year, <laughs> yeah. being, being up there in Gemini. And finally, if you wanna go find Propus and observe it for yourself and maybe even take some observations for the AVSO, you can find it up here in the constellation Gemini. Right now, Gemini is high in the Southwest in the evening. And uh, so here's, here's a map of the region and you've got the two prominent and easily recognizable twin stars of Pollux and Castor. And if you go down Castor to where his foot would be, um, that's where in this you know, roughly magnitude three, three and a half ish, depending on where it's at in its cycle. So visible uh, by, by naked eye and certainly visible in, in binoculars and telescopes. And it's, it's just southwest of the bright um, open cluster M35. I think that's an open cluster. I forgot to write down what type of cluster it was. I think it's an open cluster. <laughs> um, so uh, that, that's how you can find Propus. And this is the Greek letter Eta here for those who are unfamiliar. Um, yeah, so if you wanna find out more about how to observe Propus, you can go to aavso.org slash featured variables. And every month they have a new featured variable star that uh, new observers and experienced observers, uh, an easy one to go spot that has some interesting characteristics. So yeah, Wonderful. go ahead and give it a try tonight. If it's clear where you are. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful, great presentation, Molly, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so uh, up next will be uh, 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 Pekka Hotela from Stockholm, Sweden, and Jerry Hubble from the Mark Slade Remote Observatory, and uh, they will uh, they're going to talk about uh, their experience at uh, in uh, remote astronomy. Thank you, Scott. And that's a really hard uh, uh, relay stick you passed over for me after those guys. <laughs> So uh, uh, I will just few words about my last days and then we can get, get a bit cherry. Uh, I have done work with my remote uh, observatory, which is uh, quite far away, 20 feet away, exactly. And uh, I have uh, uh, done work with uh, the computer, mini computer with installing all the software and uh, all data they need. And uh, you can take a look now when I got the picture from uh, my cameras. So this is my view from uh, from an observatory, what I can see. So we can, we can see the sky, how limited 
this guy is we got snow today so i have a balcony can you see this picture yes yeah we see it yeah so i have a balcony over from 30 40 degrees up and upward and uh, those trees i have you have seen those trees before so i have limited with sky but uh, i will do the best what i get so in astronomy is get what you get or just leave it so there is my mount waiting for better days it's rapid for the we have a minus three celsius right now and snowing small bit so I'm working on that and uh, maybe next season I will get some deep sky photos. Maybe this uh, season, because it's the galaxy season begins and it's right forward to the south. So it's south is right there between those trees. Ah, it's a little bit of snow, it looks like, on your... Uh... Yeah, it's dropping down a little bit snow. <laughs> mm -hmm. So we can look the other other view. I have two cameras. Yes. So you can, you can see a uh -huh. little bit snow in the yes. rail there. So you can, so you can see the, all the lights and light, light pollution I have to struggle with. So this is... Right now it's uh, five in the morning mm -hmm. right here and uh, it's it's quite good cameras. It's uh, IR camera, so it's not so bright outside, <laughs> really. <laughs> so it's night time right here. It's cold black outside. Yeah, that's my observatory. And uh, now we can take with Cherry. And yes, I had uh, really really quality time yesterday with Cherry uh, uh, in uh, MSRO and uh, yeah it was uh, a great time we had a great time last night we spent about yeah. two hours two hours talking yeah. and using the system and I want to show some of the pictures we took last night yeah a couple of the pictures and uh, and also I want to first I want to share um uh, let me get back to this. Hold on. So I want to share first. This is this is the book I wrote back in 2015 with uh, my co-authors Richard Williams and Linda Ballard about remote observatories. I wrote a previous book, but this is uh, this is a book that's all about how to. Uh, design and build your remote observatory and also how to use so that's the first part of the book and the second part is how to use commercial services Richard Williams ran the Sierra Stars Observatory Network for several years and uh, so he's an expert in that area he was one of the pioneers in commercial services for telescope systems and uh, Linda Ballard uh, coordinated with uh, I think 12 different uh, astronomers that had different projects that they sent to us to describe. They wrote little sections of the third part of the book about how they were using the um, remote observatories to do science and beautiful picture imaging and, and also do an education. So there's, that's the third part of the book is all about how people all over the world are using uh, these remote systems. And so overall, it's a very nice, uh, I think, a nice overview of what you can do with remote observatories. Um, that's published by Springer Books. Resource, yeah. The, uh, so let me bring up this one image. I think this is the one that you, you thought was really awesome, um, Pekka. Yeah. It, when we what, did it. Um, was it the 180 seconds or 60 seconds? This is a hundred. This is a three minute of NGC twenty one seventy five. Uh, you see that? And only <laughs> three <Yeah>. minutes. <laughs> that's it's, a three minute. Yeah, that's a three minute exposure. 
And this is actually, I looked on uh, Wikipedia, this, this object is actually a, a star cluster, but it's got nebulosity all around it. And uh, this, is, this is through uh, blue and red maximum. nebulosity. Yeah, so you can see, this is, you see the performance. This is, a, this is the same telescope that uh, um, Doug Struble has. That's the 165 at our MSRO observatory. And I'll show a picture of that in a minute. But this, this uh, I've got it, the F7 focal reducer on it. So it's got a focal length of 853 millimeters and uh, F5.1. And it does a great uh, wide field view of the sky. This image is 1.3 by 0.9 degrees uh, in size, but it's critically sampled. So you get all the information the sky will give you our location. We're not on top of a mountain. We're in the backyard in uh, an urban, uh, rural suburban area. It's basically across. Uh, it's a transition between a rural, rural and, uh, and uh, suburban area with boreal four skies. And um, so when uh, Pekka first saw this image come across, he was pretty happy with uh, the way it was <laughs> turned out. Yeah. Um, and I was so amazed about the uh, accuracy of, of the focus, focusing, remotely focusing. Oh, yeah. The, right. the software, it, uh, it blew my mind. Yeah, so Maxim DL has a nice autofocus system and it'll uh, automatically step through the different positions and take an image and then plot the, the half, uh, half flux uh, diameter uh, or half flux radius, uh, plot that on a chart and then it will, uh, will draw, it's a V-curve, a V-shaped curve, so it will draw the intercept to calculate the focus, the correct focus position and then adjust it there. So that's really handy. It takes all of about a minute to do the autofocus. And with the fiber, uh, carbon fiber scope, it, it, this temperature stability on the system is very good. So very rarely do I have to refocus over maybe once every hour or two at the most, uh, if the temperature is actually changing uh, once you get to that point. Um, let me show a picture of the, but it was a quite expensive night for me because in the morning I ordered two focusing motors for my refractors. Oh, did you? Yeah. <laughs> That's the I, think, I think this is showing the system, right? Do you see that? Yeah. Um, the MSR station one. Yeah, we see Am it. I sharing that? Yeah, we see it. Okay. So this is, this is, uh, what the system looks like. Actually, this is an, an older picture. We don't have the 102 on top of the scope right now. We just have, we have that in a different station now. Uh, we've got three stations at the Mark Slater Mode Observatory. This is station one within the uh, uh, domed enclosure. And uh, we use the QHY cameras. The one we have that we took this image with is a QHY 163. Uh, color camera that I've been to and and uh, use that as a science camera with filters also as with been to and it works very well in that in that mode. Um, I mostly do science work, but when I'm showing the system off to, to people like Pekka and introducing the the observatory, I, I, you know, it's easier to go to some deep sky objects. I'm typically I'm not not the best or claim to fame in deep sky imaging at all. But this system, you know, if it's tuned up for doing science, it will do deep sky images very well. Uh, so, and the opposite is true also. So if you're an expert deep sky imager, you could do science work very easily. And I would, I would promote that you start looking into that. Mm -hmm. uh, so but, uh, those words uh, Cherry told me was mind blowing for me because I was, only thinking my system for imaging but when jerry told me that you can make visually take a picture and look at the picture right <laughs> and take a random picture so you don't have to image you can just take a picture and look it and uh, yeah 
Yeah, I was fine. It is like new newborn. <laughs> yeah, let me show another one. This is another one that we took that uh, Pekka really liked. Um, this is my. This is uh, NGC twenty two sixty four. Yeah. Uh, and if you look here, look at the look at this dark detail here, and this is. Let me see how long is this. This is a three minute image also. And this is not auto guided. So the the tool we use to correct the mount is called the telescope drive master. We don't do auto guiding. We don't have to mess with that at all. And you can see how good a job it does over a three minute period. This is zoomed up quite a bit. This is 400% zoomed up. Uh, um, how many just, double star we found and triple stars yeah, in, right, the mid, right. in the middle is the triple, triple star system. Yep, yep. Do we have right, Molly? That that's the triple stars in the yeah, center. Down here, the, down, oh, up here. No, in the center. Oh, in the center. Where? Yeah. Right there, up here. A little bit up. Oh, is that the cone nebula? Yeah. Yeah, this is the. This is also the, called the Christmas tree, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. The the Christmas tree star cluster is is um, below the bottom of that image. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. So this is the cone right here. Yeah. 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 That's like the tip of it. Okay. Um. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a, I'm in the process of imaging that guy on my eight inch McCaskill at the moment in hydrogen and oxygen as well. It's okay. Really cool. Will you post it? I certainly will. It's gonna be okay. a little. It's gonna be a little while before I get all the data on it. Okay, yeah. good. Good. Nice <laughs> It'll be okay. Yeah. But uh, I guess what what Peck is talking about is so you, we just went around the sky and looked at different objects and took single frames and just started looking at them. You know, this is kind of like a visual experience when you're looking through an eyepiece. I look for uh, the amount of the stars. Yeah, yeah. that's the other thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's uh, that that um, where. So, so that object is in uh, Monoceros, which is um, just to the left of, of constellation Orion. And that's right in the wintertime Milky Way. So very, uh, not, not as star dense as the Southern Milky Way, the summertime Milky Way, of course, um, uh, when we're looking toward the core of the galaxy, but this is looking in the plane of the galaxy, but outwards. So mm -hmm. a, lot, a lot more stars than above and below the plane. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hey, okay. I was, it always strikes me about these linear strings of stars that are in the images. They just show up as yeah. this, you know, there's it's another really one cool. up there in the right hand corner. Yeah, there's a right here, like along here. Yeah. And yeah. It's kind of cool uh, to see those lines of stars that are just lined up. Yeah. I've come across a lot of, a lot of those and even little, like, like little miniature Corona Borealis shaped. Uh, yeah. <laughs> kind of C-shaped star groups as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and yeah, it's just, uh, it, there, there's a term for it where the brain sees patterns. <laughs> yeah, right. Like there is something, really cool. I forget. Yeah. yeah, anthro. You see them in clouds, you see them in, you know, landforms, all kinds of things, you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. Seeing uh seeing Finland in the moon, Pekka. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. Did you see it? <laughs> yes, actually, after you showed me the picture of the map, uh, and then the picture of the moon, I I think I do see it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it will change your view of the moon the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah, Pekka showed me that last night too. That was kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. When you looked at the moon, do you think about Finland every time? <laughs> I do that. <laughs> I put a link into um, uh, into chat for the Mark Slade Remote Observatory. Uh, Pekka, you were talking about it um, uh, earlier today on our daily show. Uh, how, how? I mean, what was your overall feeling? I mean, do you think it was uh, the time was well well spent? Um, yes, well? yes, and I can recommend for everybody who has who is interesting about remote controlling and uh, what you can do more than imaging. Yes. And you can find that you can do, you can combine that with the uh, visual. 
and that gives you more valuable time because if you take like me and Jerry took yesterday 180 seconds you can watch that picture for hours and and explore the picture that's right and, and after that just slew to another object take a picture and look at it so you have you don't have to stand in the cold you, you can of course, stand in the cold, but uh, what's nicer here, drink <laughs> coffee and, <laughs> and take a picture over there, over there. <laughs> That's true. Right, do this a, a, a survey over an hour or two and just do a bunch of different objects and just look at them as if yeah. you're looking through an eyepiece. Yeah, because- I had, I had some, some designs on doing um, in a photography Messier marathon uh, where I take a couple of subframes on on each uh, yeah. each Messier mm -hmm. object uh, over one night, just like somebody would do a visual observing Messier right. marathon. I haven't scripted it out yet, but it's March, so I better get on it. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's Messier marathon month. Wonder That's how many how many targets can I put into one sequence generator pro script? We're gonna find out. Yeah, that cool. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's great. Well, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thank yep, you, everybody. Thanks. Transition now to South America, uh, where Rodrigo Zaleda and Cesar Brolo are uh, going to talk a little bit about Southern Hemisphere astronomy. You guys want to come on? Hi, Scott. Good night. How are you? Good. Hey, Rodrigo. ¿Cómo estás? Hola, Cesar. Well, um, we uh, a little bit back and um, you, you can hear me good uh, Scott I think we're getting a little bit of feedback it sounds here. like there's a um, a machine or a vacuum cleaner or something running in, in the background uh, and for me yes in, in maybe yes maybe it's uh, it are the filters of the pool of the wine something like this our, our noise of the city, maybe, yeah. Oh, it's real. No, it could be a, a microphone. It's, an, it's, it's the open. Yes, it's not this. It's not this microphone. If not this, uh, the open microphone of, of the notebook. If not, I need to to connect with my cell phone. Uh, I can I can change. I can reconnect in half minutes. How do you prefer? It's impossible to, to hear me. Yeah, you can. He, he's suggesting that he um, uh, reconnects using his phone's microphone instead of. Yeah, that's uh, fine. That's fine. Yeah. For yeah, potentially better me. audio feed. Yes. Wait one minute. All right, who's got some good astronomy jokes? <laughs> <laughs> I've actually I've heard some, but I can never them. remember them, Molly. <laughs> <laughs> My brain is too full of science. I can't yeah. remember them either. I've got, a, I've got a really old one that's, uh, you know, you never trust an atom because they make up everything. They make up everything. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the big picture of an Australian rocket? No. Okay, it's like a boomerang because it's always return to the earth. <laughs> always returns. <laughs> hey, uh, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. All right, great. So you'll see I have two, two connections. And um, one is my original live stream. And then I went for a walk and I was like, whoa, I got some clear skies. So I'm uh, outside with my eight inch uh, just starting to calibrate the go-to so uh i'm uh, just looking at orion some clouds a little bit in the way but i see mars Pleiades, and that and so i'll pop in and out uh, when i'm i'm set up here and share some of my views oh how far has mars moved away from the Pleiades now i would say looking at my head it's about a five degrees away from Pleiades right now five degrees I missed my opportunity to, to image it, but I did see some other nice images from some folks. 
Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen it gradually. Uh, like last week, it was pretty close. So probably if you had a, a three degree uh, field of view, you could probably catch both. But now I think it's just outside of that. Yeah, it's... Uh, so I'm just uh, just setting it up right now, looking at Sirius and calibrating, and uh, I'll be in touch. Okay, sounds nice. good. Here's a joke. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson go on a camping trip. They set up their tent and fall asleep. Some hours later, Holmes wakes his faithful friend. Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson replies, I see millions of stars. What does that tell you? Watson, Watson pondered for a minute. Astronomically speaking, it tells me there are millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, it tells me that Saturn is in Leo. Time-wise, it appears to be approximately a quarter past three. Meteorologically, it, it seems that we will have a beautiful day tomorrow. What does it tell you? Holmes is silent for a moment, then speaks. Watson, you idiot, someone has stolen our tent. <laughs> that's good okay the puzzled astronomy student spent all night wondering where the sun went but then it dawned on him oh. <laughs> that's a Clyde Tomba that's a Clyde Tomba pun that's a Clyde Tomba the pun okay do we have uh, Cesar back Not yet. I don't see him yet. Hey, Rodrigo, why don't we get started with you and uh, and then Cesar can join in, okay? Okay, Scott, can you hear me? Scott? You can hear me? Yeah, you can share, sure. Okay. You're very uh, quiet, Rodrigo. <laughs> Wife tonight in La Serena is Chloe. Um, I share with you with the activity for astronomy in, in Chile, in La Serena. Uh, well, when the, the pandemic situation is stopped very activity, but uh, um, I participate in, in very uh, activity for uh, astronomy amateur in, in La Serena and share with you um, some uh, activities. Great. Can you see my picture? Yes. Yes. Well, um, um, my my company, Schnorr Optics, is a company of telescope in Chile and leader for Schnorr Optics uh, for a per scientific. And um, uh, may uh, activities uh, for uh, the community uh, go to the schools, to the uh, with the academy astronomy of uh, students and. Uh, showed with the telescope on uh, uh, learning to the, 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 the skies. And sometimes uh, go to a star parties in uh, Elki Valley um, when it's, it's open for the community. Uh, if um, go to many, many people uh, for the these star parties. And um, go to person is a first time uh, to see from the telescope and uh, wow, <laughs> this telescope in the Elki Valley skies. And another uh, activity is uh, go to the astrophotography. Uh, uh, go uh, away the city in the dark skies. It's uh, amazing uh, visual for the galaxy in the, in the dark nights. Wow, and, um, the Milky Way. 
Yes, this is a is a, a, a nice picture with the the telescope with the Milky Way. This this picture is two years ago. And in in La Serena, the principal activity is uh, organized for the Gemini Observatory. Uh, it's, it's Astro Day. Uh, uh, this activity is in, in March, uh, but uh, the pandemic is, 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 is stopped. But uh, another year is, is a very important activity in Chile for the astronomy go to the scientific for the observatories and another uh, uh, person work for the astronomy for the open the this uh, activity for all all community in Chile this is the principal activity is is uh, one day the un, is for uh, all day Many, many people uh, go to the planetary, rocket, uh, observatory uh, in the night, in observatory the, the sun in the day. This is uh, the principal activity. And another activity in Chile is, um, is the AstroTour. AstroTour in El Quibale is uh, wonderful in El Kibale and Atacama Desert. Yeah. This is um, an amazing experience in the, in the observatories uh, uh, um, amateur, like uh, Mamayuca, like uh, um, Astro Tour in uh, Atacama Desert is amazing experience in the, in the desert. And um, the astrophotography también uh, is important. Yes. Yes. Yeah, th this year for the pandemic, stop it. But uh, one month in February, the authority uh, uh, passes the per uh, mm -hmm. per permissions uh, for the Astro Tour in La Serena. In the all op uh, Astro, Astro Tour operator is working one month for many, many clients. Wow, sure, wow. sure. You know, I think it's wonderful that astrotourism is so, uh, so uh, thrives so much uh, in your region. Uh, you know, it's, it is uh, that part of Chile, and, well, I haven't been to any other part, but uh, you know, where, where you are in La Serena and Vicuña and uh, CTIO and all of that area up there. And Molly, you've been up there. I mean, it's just, it's an astronomer's Disneyland. It's incredible. You know? <laughs> yeah, I'm already planning my next trip back once the pandemic is over. <laughs> right. Yes, yes, yeah. I'm, and uh, yeah. anyone watching this program should, should definitely, uh, you know, make that trip down to Chile. Uh, you know, if you are heading down towards La Serena, you know, certainly stop in and uh, hook up with, um, Rodrigo, uh, because he knows he knows the lay of the land. He knows all the. Uh, he's very connected to the astronomical community. You know, he's an astronomer himself, and uh, so he's um, he'd really make uh, set you up for a great experience. And Cesar, you made it. That's great. <laughs> yes, yes. First yes. of all, I found that I didn't had. I removed it maybe. Uh, in a moment, a Zoom from the Zoom application from my my uh, my smartphone. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Now, now I am again. Yeah. Well, it's a better camera and much better sound, so it's it's good. It's very good. Yes. 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 Because it's my, my notebook is, is powerful but old and maybe have some problem in in, I don't know, the cooler or something that make noise, I don't know. Mm. But it's, it's good for, to, to manage uh, the, the equipment, but uh, bad for, for uh, Zoom or meeting, apparently. 
um, uh, well, uh, we we have a uh, maybe you can see the the, the clouds in, in the sky. Yes. yes, I know that both both you and Rodrigo got clouded out uh, tonight. Uh, yes. So um, Rodrigo was uh, talking about the community in uh, Chile and uh, what that offers to amateur astronomers and astrotourism. What can you tell us about uh, about uh, uh, you know visiting astronomers into Argentina? What what is that like? Uh, um, um, uh, astronomers, prof uh, professional astronomers, or or amateurs? Amateur, uh, amateur astronomers. Uh, okay, okay. Yes. Yes. Uh, well, you know that. Uh, the, um, despite uh, despite uh, the pandemic situation this year, the the activities uh, in Argentina are very strong about amateur astronomy. Uh, exists a huge community of astronomers, and um, of course that many of them work in astroturismo. Uh, because it's a, I think that it's a, um, a huge movement in the world because everywhere the people is going to, to start to, to, to work in this area. Um, uh, here in Argentina uh, exist many, many groups uh, that work in astrotourism uh, in San Juan or in Mendoza or in the Patagonia, um, where the people go to, the, to see the stars in very dark areas. And it's a, it's a wonderful, uh, uh, they have a, a wonderful um, experience. Um, it's, a, um, it's a different, for example, we, we uh, every year, um, <clears throat> uh, we make uh, an Easter party in Mendoza and San Rafael, where we have a meeting of, uh, we invite professional astronomers and physics uh, that work in different areas uh, because uh, we are amateur astronomers or, uh, and we are very interested in, in listening uh, professionals that um, that connect with the people uh, about their experience, um, how is work in big observatories, and uh, this is very interesting. Um, we receive every year uh, people from everywhere that work in in biggest observatories in Chile or San Juan, Argentina, or Mm -hmm. uh, many times we receive people that uh, from Japan that work in uh, in remote mode, uh, for example, in in uh, Hawaii Mauna Kea Observatory, and for us it's amazing to to uh, to receive these this, uh, people that connect with a, a very intensive work. And our surprise is that every year, these people that came to our surf party mm -hmm. uh, in Mendoza, they are amazing too, because yeah. they connect with the people with a real sky without a screen, if not only the sky and the telescopes. You know, we use um, in the surf parties uh, uh, 15 uh, inches uh, Dobsonian, or you know binoculars, telescopes of every a, any type, and of course that we make astrophotography. But uh, it's different when you make a live astrophotography under an incredible sky. That if you are in a biggest a big observatory, uh, maybe in a place where you don't see the sky, and you are working. Over a, um, over a, um, you know, uh, graphics with numbers about uh, about measures measures of uh, photometry or 
different things out of us. Uh, and they, they really enjoy uh, uh, when we connect with professionals, they, they enjoy uh, really the, the star parties. It's very interesting because it's the community in Argentina between professionals and amateurs is really, is really connected. It's, it's incredible, but normally it's easy to, to get professionals uh, that enjoy amateur star parties. Yes. This is it. It's nice. It's nice. Hey, it's easier nice. Can I interrupt for a second? Sure, Cameron. Okay, I have clouds surrounding everywhere, but I have a little peephole, and I want to try a little experiment, if you don't mind. I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Uh, see your screen. Start now. Okay. Is my screen sharing? Let's Not try yet. that again. Okay. No, yes. Start now. And I want to say Zoom. Where is it? Say yes. Okay. Okay. Now, can you see my screen? Yes. Awesome. Okay. We're going to have some fun now. Okay. So this is a live view of my, uh, can you see the, um, the field of view? It just looks black. I, I can see stars. You can see a couple oh, three, of stars. Three stars. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to zoom in. And then uh, this is actually the Eskimo Nebula. And, uh, what, what I'm going to do is uh, I have it at 3,200 four-second exposure. I'm just going to take a picture. Okay. Is this the, your and, smartphone? Yeah, this is my smartphone. Wow. I'm going to give it two. Because of the vibration, I'm going to give it two-second delay. Okay. And then uh, let's move this uh, over there. Oops, sorry. How come it's not uh, working here? Wait. Somehow it's blocking. Okay, let's try that again. Oh, the uh, the screen share is blocking my. Let me try to try here. Oh, there we go. Okay, here we go. And you can see everything, right? It says taking picture. Yeah. And all that. Great, great, great. Uh, I mean. And then now. Yeah. yeah. And then if I click there, there you go. Yeah. Wow. Is that? Uh, there it is. Wow. Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Isn't excellent, that cool? Excellent. Excellent. That's cool. <laughs> So I, I wanted to see how this works because I, I, I joined the live stream on my computer. And of course, now I have to have another instance uh, on my phone. And I'm just, I got, I was like, hey, there, you know, there's clouds all around. And then there's just a little pocket there. Pocket and so, and, and this is the way I can share my viewing experience. So this is, this is great. Yeah. Um, so now, if you don't mind, um, I'm going to zoom out here and let's, uh, let's go to Mars. It, Mars, uh, it, it hasn't cooled down, so there's a lot of tube current. Mm -hmm. But uh, just just for fun, let's go Cameron, to Mars. Yeah, Cameron, you take better, better pictures with your smartphone, and I do with no, 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 yes, no. you do. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know what matter? You know what matters, Pekka, is 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 we're both having lots of fun. Yeah, you know <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but those pictures <laughs> with the smartphone. <laughs> uh, Okay, so there you see, it, uh, pretty not not bad, pretty good alignment. So I got Mars, and if I uh, zoom in here, I'll just uh, do a little bit of adjustment. It's going to be not very good, but you know, I can probably take a video and do some stocking and stuff. But there you go, there's Mars. Yeah. And if I change the exposure, this let me play with this. Uh, so this is 3200. Let's make it uh, a little there. lower here. There we go. A lot of uh, modern smartphones have a, a manual, or sometimes they call it a pro mode. Um, so you can go That's in and I'm... adjust. And I'm telling the rest of the audience. because Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so you can do what he's doing and adjust the ISO and the exposure time and, and the focus mm -hmm. and the color, the white balance and stuff like that. I, and think I, will, I think I will wrap up my stuff tomorrow and <laughs> buy a smartphone. <laughs> So this is uh, 10 times digital zoom. You can see a little bit of atmospheric uh, uh, dispersion or uh, refraction, I should say. 
a little bit of red on the left. But uh, anyhow, you, you you know, if I play play with this a little bit more, let's go. Can you detect a little bit of the gibbous phase of that too? You can. It's in the upper right. It looks like, and that would yeah. make sense. Yeah. 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 I would say so. So not not bad, you know. So uh, and now uh, one more one more thing. Uh, the clouds, unfortunately, the clouds are blocking Orion Nebula. So it's. Uh, and let me go. Um, This is, uh, I don't know how this is going to look like. I have to change the exposure now. Let's get it all the way up. And hi, there we go. So this is the Pleiades. Um, if I probably just uh, go there right here. There you go. See if we can get the recognized. <laughs> you have a steady hand. Yeah, he does. <laughs> oh, actually, you know what? Actually, I got—I went the wrong way. So let me just—I'll uh, increase the speed a little bit. There we go. There, there you go. There's the center of the Pleiades. Whoops! I went a little bit fast. Let me just slow it down again. Sorry about that. There we go. And there's the center of the Pleiades. This is a little bit. If I put the forty millimeter eyepiece in, I could—I can do it. But the smartphone adapter is is a little bit uh, unstable i've done it on the uh, on it and it, it it goes around the eye cup and it but it's uh but i prefer to stick it all the way around to get a solid connection so there you go and then uh, what i do is uh you know w w jerry's famous uh, half power uh, maximum bandwidth or whatever <laughs> or full uh half full width half maximum i should say if i zoom right in this is how i i focus without a batten off mask i just uh, like 10 times is pretty good Oh yeah, uh, and then and then I just basically just play with that until I get it. It's not awesome, but it's you know it's it's okay. And then once I got that to where I want, then I can zoom back out, and then have a pretty pretty decent view. And then uh, what else can I show? Uh, oh, oh yeah yeah, this is a good one. Yeah, let's go, let's go there. Double cluster is in prime location. Let's uh, let's go to double cluster. Okay, so. And I'll show you afterwards how I'm doing all this. I have my tablet uh, on a on one of those uh, those little um, what do you call it? Uh, those little grabby things or whatever the little holders with a like a metallic bendable metallic uh, arm, and uh, that that rotates with the telescope, so it makes it very easy to. Um... Okay, let me just go down here. This is an excellent way to learn kids because every kid from five years and older has a smartphone. That's cool. And there's your double cluster. And then if I if I uh, if I uh, just change the let me just do a quick uh, four second, and let's do it four hundred. You know, maybe maybe five hundred. Let's do that. Take a picture. Oops, sorry. There we go. One, two, and then. Thing. Let's see how it turned out. Wow. There you go. Oops. Sorry about that. There you go. Beautiful. Not bad, eh? Jesus. What's Got that? Double the double up to the left there? No, that's that's the artifact. I, I, I use this black electrical tape. I haven't figured that out yet. There's an infrared uh, thing that goes in there. It gets in the eyepiece, I see. the reflection. So it, it causes some artifacts. So, I see. so yeah. Yeah, I've, I've learned, uh, you know, after you look a at a lot of galaxies that are like 15th magnitude and an 18 inch dob, you start to see things, <laughs> you know, and uh, and then you start recognizing what's what's real and not. But I can tell you what's really helped. Let me show you now. Um, I'm going to take uh, take this uh, off the eyepiece for a second here. Is that camera the Celestron ZUX holder you have? So I'm, now I'm going to share. I'm still sharing my screen, but let me stop sharing my screen. I'm going to. Oops, sorry, that was not the one. Uh, where? How did it go? Ah, oh, there we are. It's Zoom. It's not sharing. It's not sharing right now, Cameron. Okay, I'm going to start my video. And uh, is it recording the video? Can you see anything? Mm -hmm. uh, video, and then share camera. Here we go. Share camera. Is it? 
Looks black right now. Looks black and darn. Okay, it's sorry. Black. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Take off the. Sh okay, so I'm not going to share. And then I go video. Oh, here, here's probably the problem. If I go video and I go around. Ah, yeah, that, that was it. Okay, now, now can you see? Yeah. Okay. Uh, does it work? Uh, when I put it horizontally, does that throw off the uh, orientation? No, it flips. Okay, great, great, great. So um, you can't see the scope, but uh, anyhow, this is, I don't know if you can see the sky. It's, yeah, I, never mind. But this is my tablet. And what is really nice, as you can see, I was just at the double cluster right now. And uh, what's really nice is uh, you can actually get it right in there and, and, and it's great for plate solving, right? You can get right in where you want and then, and then go exactly uh, where, where, this is Sky Safari. And if I go like, let's say right now, I wanna go back to Mars, I just go to Mars and then I click on that and go, go to, and you can see, you know, you, I know uh, you've shown this a lot, uh, Jerry, and you're with Carte de Soleil and stuff. Yeah, um, right. And basically, uh, it goes there, and then, oops. And then what I've done is I've, uh, all these rings here are the different fields of view for my eyepieces. So, for example, I um, go to my scope display. I have my... Uh, 40 millimeter in there is, oh, well, it's a little bit fuzzy. Sorry for that. Uh, 40 millimeter. I got my 26. I got my uh, 13 and my seven. And so that basically comes up with these. And that really helps when you're trying to uh, plate solve. Even if you can't see the object, you can triangulate. There's usually enough stars uh, in the field of view to be able to uh, find exactly where that object is. So that's how I'm able... That's what I want to do with um, uh, the, these in the future is, is get, get good enough with the smartphone so that I can start stacking and taking pictures of areas where I know the galaxy is or I know that faint object is and then, uh, and then basically uh, uh, show the image on stuff that I couldn't normally see with my, uh, you know, visually. Anyhow, so let me uh, stop the video. Yeah, thanks. Thank so, you. Uh, yeah. So, hopefully, that was interesting. <laughs> really good, really nice. <laughs> yes, it was. So, Caesar um, and uh, Rodrigo, we were kind of we were finishing up. Uh, uh, maybe Rodrigo's already already hit hit the the bed here, but. Uh, uh, Caesar, it seems like uh, there's just a ton of stuff to do uh, for professional and amateur astronomers in Argentina. What's the best way for what's the best way for them to get connected? Is there a, a particular club? Should they go to? Should they contact you directly, or how do you think? Uh, exist a, a lot of different clubs uh, clubs in Argentina. The 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 um, the oldest club in Argentina is um, uh, uh, well, it says Asociación Argentina Amigos de la Astronomía, 4 A's. And this is in Parque Centenario in, in, in the middle of the city of Buenos Aires. This is a very huge cl astronomy club with domes. And very, it's from the, from the, from the first uh, time of the 20th century. Uh, is an amateur astronomy club from from the maybe 1910. Um, it's really really an old club. It, it is in Buenos Aires, but any any place have an astronomy club. Um, today uh, it's very easy uh, to find clubs or associations in Facebook or Instagram, and the people uh, uh, have really really. Um, uh, a good opportunities to to start to know astronomy um, exist a, a, a huge um, uh, uh, huge places uh, uh, about uh, about uh, 
uh, or, or where you can get an used uh, telescope, first owner telescope or second owner telescopes. Um, it's really, it's, uh, today is a, is a golden age of uh, amateur astronomy in Argentina. The only problem is that uh, with the su successive uh, uh, economical crisis, um, the people normally is done affordable to, to, um, to have a better equipment. Not all people have uh, a good equipment for astronomy, especially in astrophotography where the people need more, spend more money in, in equipment. But uh, they have a really opportunities to, to go to an astronomy club. Um, in many, many places do you have a, a lot of opportunities in Argentina to, to make astronomy. Hmm. That's wonderful. Um, is there a particular website you'd like to direct them to, Caesar? Uh, for example, uh, in, in our in our business, uh, our Facebook is uh, amateur uh, astronomia. Sorry, astronomia dot amateur in Spanish in Castellano. That is amateur astronomy, but in Castellano. Yeah. It's our our Facebook page. Uh, it's a huge community. Another another um, community in Facebook very is with more than thirty. 30,000 people is Amigos wow. de Astronomia, the same uh -huh. name like, like the club. And the all Spanish community uh, enjoy this, this Facebook. Um, uh, well, uh, 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 the people from Bella Vista El Cosmos, the, the club uh, of uh, the solar observatory that you know, yeah. uh, have a very, is, is growing with only le less than five years of activities, they are growing a lot, really. Well, I am part of this club too. I am part of many, many clubs because I am. Uh, every time I'm sharing, they are the people sharing with me yeah. activities. Um, I am. I am really. I am uh, fortunate to to be every every all time invited to the to to be part of of uh, of the of the community this yeah. is nice really because it's it's not only a distributor of telescope if not i am really a uh, um participative uh, 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 part of of the the entire community uh, astronomy community is it is nice really this mm -hmm. is nice no, oh, that's really great. It's really great. Yeah, I can't wait to get to uh, down to Buenos Aires sometime and visit you and visit the shop where you work and uh, and also to meet uh, a big group of amateur astronomers. It'll be a lot of fun. Yes, absolutely. Okay, all right. Well, uh, also up very late is uh, Gary Palmer in the UK. What time is it there, Gary? Hi, Scott. Hi, everyone. Um, it is 10 to 5, roughly. 10 to 5. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Well, yeah well, thanks uh, for hanging in there with us. Um, we had a, a long uh, line of uh, astronomers today, so it was, but it was great. It was wonderful. And uh, yeah, I've been, I've been watching it. it. It's been very interesting. Some nice images from different people. Yeah. Um, yeah. Lot, lots nice of different things there to uh, and, and, uh, keep you interested, as they say. Yes. Mm -hmm. And how are things going on in your, your part of the world? Yeah, it's okay. Storm in tonight. Um, so it's pouring with rain outside. Ah. Um, that's in for a couple of days and then hopefully it'll start clearing back up again. But it's still not got warm yet. That's the problem. Yeah. So right. still only about five. Letting go is a bad combination. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's pretty boring. So there's not um not overly much been going on um i'll share over the screen there By we go the, way, the uh, european edition of the global star party that you uh, co-hosted was fantastic and uh so thanks it, it was good fun i think everybody enjoyed it who was yeah. on there lots of yeah. messages afterwards so 
Um, on the European one, we discussed that all sky camera and we were looking at images off of it. That's right. So the night after I left it running, um, we caught a meteor straight through right overhead. That was one of the shots from it, mm -hmm. um, which seemed to work quite well. Um, also did a time lapse video from the shots that night. Um, there we go. So wow. that's that running through. You'll see all sorts of different oh, things yeah. coming through. The Milky Way coming up. Yeah. So it was about two and a half hours, something like that. Yeah. Um, while we were doing the star party, we had the scope on M51. We didn't have any guiding on it, and it was sort of high, lots of high cloud coming through. So that was about as good as that got from the evening. Um, it was cloudy too. So yeah. Also, the Leo triplet that came out a little oh, bit better. Wow, that's nice. That's very nice. Um, oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. We put the all of the images from the sky camera into a star trail. So that, that was about it for the last couple of days since. But mm -hmm. um, what I did, I had quite a lot of questions um, on my Facebook page of how you're doing these um, movies and style trails. So I thought a quick look at the, the movies was the easiest thing to do. And they are really simple to do. You can do these in Photoshop now, um, nice and straightforward. So if you just go to your folder and open the image, so on the first image there, yeah, if we just select the image and then down the bottom, it's got image sequence. Click on that, open the image up, and then we select a frame rate of what we want. And we haven't got a lot of time here, so it's better to select a lower frame rate with it. But you, you can change this to whatever you really want. It, it's totally sure. down to how many frames you want. And you can do this with images from any camera really so dslrs they're ideal if you've been out <laughs> shooting multiple images of a night time so we can select that 10 frames a second and then if we go into window go down the bottom there we can put up timeline and this now starts to put it into movie mode um, and what we can basically do is extend the bar right across it's going to uh, trip itself up a little bit as we're doing this There we go. There we go. And then we can play it as a movie. And you can export this back out. So we can export this out as an MP4 or whatever. But it's a real simple way of actually doing this. Yeah. Um, you haven't got any work. If you want to do any work to the actual images, so if we wanted to, we've, we've played that, if we wanted to crop this, yeah, and bring it in and remove the trees, we can do all of those sorts of things. Yeah, it really depends on, on whatever you want. So if we crop that up, for instance, there we go. And then we play the movie again. So this will adjust all of the images that are in that folder. Oh, just wow. the movie. So it's not adjusting your actual original images. It's adjusted what Photoshop's loaded in. I like yeah. that. And you, you can play around with this to your heart's content. I mean, if you've done a whole night's imaging on uh, star trials, you can um, load all of those in um, nice and straightforward and nice and easy on this. But yeah, I just thought I'd share that out as there was quite a few uh, questions on it. Yeah, that's very cool. Yeah. And it's, it's pretty simple and straightforward. Yeah, it, it's, it, it takes you literally seconds. And, um, you know, all of those images in there is about 180 images in there. They exported out in probably about two or three minutes. It's one of the fastest ways of doing it rather than sitting there for hours waiting for it to convert um, into a video format. Right. And, and, and did you, uh, Gary, did you hear about the meteorite that fell in? Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, yeah we, we saw the images of that going over. Yeah, yeah. so did, did apparently that, that was visible from Scotland really down to around the Bath area, which is more or less the length of the country. Yeah. Um, and apparently today uh, it's come up in the news. They've been finding parts of it in gardens. Um, some of the scientists over here have worked out exactly where it, it landed because 
in, in this day and age, we forget that everybody's got cameras in doorbells, they've got cameras on buildings, they've got <laughs> media cameras like what I have. So the, the, the whole country's got cameras over it. So it's, it's very easy now to start working out where these things are landed. Right. Um, and the headlines over here are um, some of the first meteorites found for about 30 years over here. So yeah, uh, that, that's not bad going. Yeah, it's really cool. It's really cool. I posted a link in chat. Uh, that's a CNN article, but it's on the BBC. It's everywhere. So uh, yeah, really yeah. remarkable, uh, uh, you know, Somebody would be earning some good money out of that. Yes. Yeah, they're, they're, they're worth quite a lot these days um, once you start slicing them up. So uh, I expect to see that going up on uh, a, a couple of the um, the uh, trading places for the meteorites. Yes. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. Hey, well, Scott and Gary, can, can I interrupt for one quick uh, yeah. shot? Yeah, sure. Okay. Right. Sorry for that, uh, but let me just quickly share my screen here. Yeah. Okay. So. Part of the program, this is open discussion at this point, and uh, so you guys can share and talk about anything that you like, of course. So. Who's that guy? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's move this other way. So this is my with my forty millimeter, um, and this is in the Schmidt Cassegrain. So this is maximum field of view. So I managed to frame the Pleiades. Just can you see it? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I managed to get the oh, yeah. Pleiades so just in there, just in there. Yeah. yeah. And so if I take a quick, quick, quick shot here, and you can take a look at it. There you go. So just wanted to have a quick share, and because it, 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 you can see the big meaning, of course, I didn't optimize it, but at least uh, you know it's it's uh, it's um, it's really nice. I, I love this. Is the uh, this is your explorer scientist. This is a 6840 uh, uh, okay. from uh, I got from you, Scott, uh, actually over over uh, the holidays. So it oh. works beautifully with my uh, with my eight inch. Wonderful. Wonderful. Anyhow, let me just. Uh, yeah, it's good. Now, which, uh, which app is this that you're using in particular? So I'm just using the I'm just using the uh, I'm just using the phone. Um, so basically, this is what happens. So you can still see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. So so if I if I go to the normal camera phone, uh, it this goes into photo mode. This is where it automatically does everything, mm -hmm. and that's all nice. But then if I go to more here, go to more. I see. Then then there's pro mode, and if I click on pro mode. Then you have. Uh, I always uh, I set the uh, the uh, focus to uh, to infinity, yeah. right? ISO so, settings, and, and then I change the ISO to, to whatever. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, if I want to maximize the amplifier, the, the good part about uh, changing the ISO settings where you're framing the object, as as you can see, it changes the uh, exposure live. Oh yeah. Uh, right. So you can go if you go down here, you can see nothing. But then if you go all the way up to thirty two hundred. It gives you a good view already, right? Without even taking a picture. That camera then, is really fairly low noise. I mean, you're at 3,200 ASA or ISO, yeah. right? And uh, yes. So I have an old iPhone 8. And when I do that, I have an app that will take me to that ISO setting and it just blows it out, <laughs> you know? So I, ha I have to go to a much lower uh, ISO setting. But so. The other thing, Scott. No, no, you're right. And and the other thing that they've done with smartphones now is they increased the uh, custom uh, exposure time. So it typically was 10 seconds. Yeah. But with with this phone, you can go all the way to 30, which is which gives you another another dimension, which is nice. Yeah. Great for galaxies. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Speaking of which, I, um, I'm going to quickly slew over. Um, I'm, uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime, but I'm just going to slew over to the triplet here because that's uh, clear. There's there's no clouds, so let's quickly see if I can. Probably won't be able to do that without a picture. So what we'll do is, when it gets over there, I'm gonna we'll frame it, get the right uh, visual plate solved, and then once I got that, then I'll. But we might be lucky. We might be able to see the core. The core with uh, 3200, and and then I can take a, a quick snapshot. Of course, it's in the opposite direction, so it's it's almost there. Sure. But it's not very good transparency right now. It's uh, 
like I said, there's a bunch of high clouds in between. Okay, it's just getting there right now. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, let's see here. I don't really see anything right now. So let's just take a, what I do if I can't see anything is I, I take a quick, oh, there is something. Okay, great. Oh, hey, there might be something there. Okay, so let's take a quick four second exposure at 3200. Sure. So let's see what happens with this. Well, test shot. Oh, there you go. Oh. So you can you can you can see there's yep. part of it. Yep. And then and then th this is the artifact. Unfortunately, the artifact is right on top of the. So you, this this is not a spiral arm. This is a mm -hmm. part of the artifact. But you can see the. So if I shift it a little bit, let me just shift the, the image a little bit. Uh, let's move it. Uh, Probably this way is good. Oh, the other way. It's helpful when there's a star in, in the view. Uh, you can frame it. Yeah. Okay, let's take another another shot here. And I'm also, of course, I'm only seeing two of the three. There you go. So we ignore the artifacts, but you can see uh, uh, 66 and uh, that's at 66 and 65 right there. And then uh, not bad, actually. Actually, this yeah. is, you can see a little bit of the spiral structure in this guy here. And then you can play with the uh, ISO. What I do is this is a four second. So let's let's just, uh, if, you, if you don't mind uh, bearing with me, I'm going to go with um, lower ISO. I, 1600 is kind of optimum. And then I go higher exposure. So let's do a, fifth, uh, a 15 second and do that and see how that turns out. And that should be a cleaner image. It's still gonna, um, it's still gonna have those artifacts. I, I, when I get rid of those and I start stacking stuff, this, this is gonna be a lot, a lot niftier, but uh, I'm just happy to be able to share this with you guys uh, real time. Let's see here. Okay, so see, this is now, you can see less grainy. Oh, yeah, that's definitely. Yeah. A, little more, a little more blown out, but, uh, but not bad, right? Not, not, bad. not bad. Yeah. And so, and anyhow, so, and this is with the 40 millimeter. Um, so uh, you can see it's the kind of uh, using the edge of the field there, but uh, yeah, so that's what I got. I'll, I'll, I'll stop sharing now. Mm. Didn't want to, but I tell you, I'm just so happy to, um, oh, well, where, there we go. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah, so I'm just so happy to be able to, to share this because there's not too many clear nights here in the winter in Seattle. So right. this right. is great. <laughs> Thanks. It's so, it's so um, you know, straightforward and easy. I mean, you know, there's a technique, but it um, uh, looks very promising that you can do uh, smartphone astrophotography like that. If you'd asked me, you know, years ago, uh, if people would be using their phones to take astrophotographs, I would have said absolutely no way. <laughs> I just couldn't imagine it, but uh, but here we are. So Well, I was, I'm flabbergasted because the size of the pixels keep shrinking and they still get the noise down. And I don't understand how they're doing that. It's like alien technology to get that noise <laughs> level down. <laughs> oh yeah, like the, 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 the camera said, I mean, there was a time when, when they were shifting, of course, from film into digital photography and then finally, digital photography you everyone had those little quick cameras and stuff and then finally the smartphone and then we finally ditched the the the, the digital cameras because uh you know 90 percent of our pictures were with a smartphone were pretty darn good mm -hmm. and uh you know it's like uh it's amazing now i just carry one device you know just carry the phone around and right and and uh you know still you, you can't beat of course the, the larger optics on the uh, on the on a full dslr but but boy if you look at the percentage of time and, and, and the quality that, that, that equation uh, is really in favor of the smartphone. Now they, they, they have now multiple cameras with different optical zoom levels. Yeah. So the, so to, to Jerry's point, it, what's amazing is these are very tiny CCDs. They're, they're not large at all. Right. I mean, but they're, they're super high density and, and yet low noise. That's, that's, I don't know how they do it, but anyhow, it's, it's pretty cool. Right, and the multiple optics you can emulate what larger optics do with with depth of field and all the other tricks and gizmos you have with the software to emulate what a larger 
uh, lens element would do for you with the depth of field and other things. Right, Jerry. And in fact, I, I want to get to that equation on pixel scale uh, um, to make sure I get the optimum size, the right eyepiece, focal length, and and image scale uh, to match these smartphone CCD uh, uh, chips because there's there's a way probably to optimize it uh, so that you you can get even more sharper stars, right? Yeah, I'm sure there's, uh, you want to be critically sampled no matter what you're imaging because the sky will only give you so much. So you don't want to oversample and you don't want to undersample, but that's correct. You could probably figure it out uh, by looking at different images and different eyepieces. Yeah, yeah, that's what a, one, of my, one of my homework. <laughs> oh, that's great, that's great. Well, is, is, uh, are we, uh, do we have uh, more to... Um, share tonight or how's it looking with the group here well there's not correct i'm surprised i'm still awake <laughs> yeah you are still awake <laughs> <laughs> yeah richard was really tired after uh, working all day so yeah there's not not a lot from this side the uh the view off of the all sky camera is um that <laughs> that's right. it for today so um yeah, yeah. Nothing much going on there. Yeah, well, the sun's coming up now. Oh, so I sympathize, Gary. I, I see that a lot <laughs> being here in Seattle. I'm in the UK, so we we spend most of the winter like that. Yeah, um, it, it has started to get better. I will say that. I think we had uh, four or five days here or there last week where we got a few hours and in. Imaging. Is, it, um, is it better during the day, Gary, sometimes, so you can do your solar imaging? or No, you know, it's, uh, it's or funny. Mess? I mean, as winter seasons go, it, even on the solar, it's been really bad. Um, normally, I'm managing to pick off, you know, you can drop down scalar telescope and all sorts of things to counteract the low sun, but we're, we're just not getting the clear skies. So, yeah, um, and, and that's it. So... Although luckily now we, the sun is just starting to rise up a little bit. So if we get onto the um, sun at sort of two or three in the afternoon, it's getting high enough now to still get some reasonable quality images. Um, but really you're at the end of, sort of the end of this month, early next month, and then it's really starting to get high. So if you get that little bit of high cloud there or something going on, you can punch straight through it. And it, it, that's the thing. Whereas when you lower to the horizon, it, it sort of it, it collapses together, very similar to your poor seeing of a nighttime. If you're down near the horizon, then your stars are all bouncing around. Well, the, the image solar images are doing exactly the same thing in the daytime through the winter. So, but yeah, um, it looks like it's getting more active. We're getting a lot more sunspots. Uh, there's another one rota rotated in yesterday. Um, and you, you're starting to see a lot more uh, complex prominences and filaments on the sun now. So um, mm -hmm. we're gradually starting to see a rise in activity. Um, looking forward to the summer, really. All the stuff we've been working on in the background for um, while it's been in solar minimum, we can now start putting to use and trying those ideas out, uh, see what we come up with. Um, cool. So some of them I've been putting in over the last couple of weeks and they seem to be working okay. So just need some nice dense active areas and then we can really see what we can do. Yeah, I'm sure you're going to turn out some pretty amazing stuff coming up here. You know, you're... you're... Yeah, it, 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 it's all weather related. It's the same old thing, you know. In the daytime, I say, I see on solar what you're looking through at the nighttime. I see it every day of the week. And obviously with sun behind it, it really highlights what's happening in the atmosphere. So at the night time, we just see, you know, the stars really twinkling. We don't really understand what's going on up there. But a, um, a good few hours on solar soon shows you how good or how bad the skies are. And sometimes you can get a few days back, um, we had some cloud there, but in between the gaps, the scene was phenomenal. It was really, really nice. Um, so you, you can't tell until you get the scope out and start looking you can't tell what it's going to be right right wonderful we've had a great star party today I mean uh, you know uh, 
David Levy starts off with his poetry and, uh, you know, talking about, um, you know, just uh, the various aspects of being a, in, into astronomy. Uh, David Eicher took us across the distant scale of the universe. We had uh, Libby, Libby gave probably her best uh, talk, um, you know, the, that she's given. She was actually invited by a Dave Iker to write an article for Astronomy Magazine. She's only 11 years old, my goodness, you know. Um, yes, she's done great. Yes, great. Huh? So she did a great uh, talk about the uh, sequence of stars, you know, where they're going, uh, you know, into, uh, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, a dwarf stage or supernova stage, you know, in their, in their life cycle. Um, you know, incredible astrophotography, uh, you know, Doug Struble showed, uh, you know, came out with uh, showing live images and then all those amazing planetary images that he loves doing, uh, you know, and he's in Bortle eight skies. I mean, he's just, you know, super mm -hmm. light polluted. His, uh, his uh, uh, mission is to show people that they can do high quality astrophotography from the city, you know, um, uh, you know, and uh, Molly Wakeling with her work with the AABSO, um, Caesar and uh, Rodrigo from South America, you know, uh, telling, telling us what it's all about. And uh, even the Astro Beard being here when he's dead tired and, yeah. uh, you know, <laughs> and Cameron Gill is showing what's, uh, what's possible just with a smartphone is kind of mind blowing. So uh, I think part of this thing, so part of the, the philosophy that we're starting to see emerge and we talked about scott is that mm -hmm. that uh you know we, we're trying to break these traditional uh rules of thumb and the traditional knowledge that people have the way astrophotography has been done for the last 20 30 years yes we're breaking those molds you know we're trying to say no there's a lot more to it than that there's a lot more you can do if you just look into it and get some skills and knowledge then you start to understand that, yeah, maybe the traditional knowledge that you find on cloudy nights isn't so, isn't so good, you know. Well, you know what it is. I think it's a, it's like a bridge. We're, we're building a ladder with the technology. So, you, you know, now you're bringing accessibility to a lot more people, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, the the traditional, a lot of the old school, and a lot of the knowledge that was gained from the hard work of astrophotography still carries to today and and so that's that's that will always be there but then now those were those expensive rigs and you know all the cool stuff that you can do that's something that everyone can aspire to but it, it now it's such not, not such a big reach to get yeah, there not, not out of reach. Yeah. it's not out of reach it's starting to you're starting to make people you know just like it's like the american dream sorry to be political but you know just getting it so that everyone can have access and then everyone has a chance at contributing and and then they can start to say hey everyone can go at their level right there's much more granularity now which is yeah. really good i think it's also about everybody thinking outside the box you know you don't don't take everything for granted of what you read and what you see right it's about you know thinking about things and, and you know if you've got ideas run with them have a, have a go at them. You, you, it's very hard to find some information on lots of things. Um, yes. So you, you, until you play with those things, you, you don't know. And it, it might be that eureka moment. You come up with something and you come up with your way of doing it and your way of enjoying it. Yeah. That's true. That's that. Well, that's been your whole story, Gary. You know, you. Yeah. You, I mean, you know, on the solar side. Right. I mean, I, my whole thing was. Right from the beginning, um, I love the dynamics of it. I love looking at it. I never look on any of the uh, satellites in the mornings. I always want to look at the sun myself and see what's there. And that yeah. then becomes the challenge. The challenge is your seeing conditions, the position of maybe a prominence, whether it's further around the limb, so it's very dim, or whether it's moving really fast. Uh -huh. um, and then it's kicking the brain in as to what equipment's going to be the best. Once you've seen what you're going to go after, it's what we're we going to change to now to, you know, capture that close up or, or get in there. Um, and there is that balancing act. 
you know, the, the seeing conditions, um, all of those sort of things come together and, and it, it becomes that daily challenge. Yeah, because no one prominence is going to move the same as the other one. And that, that's the key then. That, that's what you're after. So, um, but if I'd listened to people in the past, I wouldn't be doing it. You know, they, they were all saying And we did it the other day. We, we took a colour camera and we imaged the sun with a colour camera. You know, when I first got into it, everybody was going, oh, no, you can't do that. Colour <laughs> cameras don't work in Hydra and Alpha. It's like, well, watch. <laughs> yeah <laughs> right yeah that's great um, and that's what i mean by thinking outside the box it, it's a case of like don't rely on all of the information there because some of it is older it, you know it's coming from the old days so technology as cameron's proving is moving along at a real rapid pace now and it, it's given people the options to really uh play around with and have fun with the this stuff not get too bogged down in all the seriousness of it. Right. And if people, a lot of times people, customers will say, well, can your equipment do this or that? Or can I try, can I do this? You know, just well, do it. Just try it. Even trying it, right? Just I mean, try it. Yeah, just try it. I mean, don't ask us. I mean. Mix this with that. And <laughs> try right. that and don't ask us. Just do it and see yeah. if it works for you. And if you wow. have some, if you have a question about it, then then you come to us and ask. Well, it looks like you did this and it was working for you. So maybe you, you know, try to tweak that. Know, Jerry, I mean, if they can't, you know, when you go and you're buying a, uh, you know, an adapter or something, uh, you know, even if it's fifty bucks or a couple of hundred bucks or thousand dollars or whatever it might be you know you'd like to get as much information as you can so i understand that part but there's people that already have all the gear they already right. have it and they they want to ask well you know from the expert okay is this is this the way it's supposed to go you right. you know you become the expert by trying it you know and and figuring it out and um, right uh you know it's nice to bounce ideas off of people but uh um but yeah, dive in, you know, dive in. That, that, that's part of it. And I, I don't think anyone can know the answers for all of the equipment. No. You can, you can take an educated guess. Yeah. You know, but you, you could be completely wrong. You, right. you know, somebody can surprise you and, and, and come up with some different use for something or uh, whatever. But, you know, really the, the whole of this is about enjoying it and it shouldn't be a chore. You know, whatever you're trying to do in it shouldn't be a chore. It, it should be enjoyment right. and should be having fun. And, right. and that that's the key um, to this. And I think Yeah, and you know what what I what I love is what's happening now, Gary and Scott Jerry. Um, the uh, the smaller telescopes are kind of going through a revolution now, right? I mean yeah. because of the imaging capabilities. I mean, I'm seeing stuff now with with these simple smart phone phone shots on on a on a little i can't wait to get my ed80 but i i you know on my mac 102 four inch uh that i you know it takes a, a much larger aperture uh to visually see that and you can get a you can have a blast and this is kind of to pekka's point earlier you know he he must have had a great time gary uh, and, and it was a jerry i think it was jerry yeah. right mm -hmm. yeah with you uh when you were showing him that that live kind of stacking uh that must have been fantastic because it's That's it's so nice to just zip around and right. you know have that hybrid approach where you're you're doing imaging but you're also observing at the same time right it's a uh, single frame imaging where you just go to a different target and see what you can see with the three minute image or one minute image depending on how bright the object is you know you can you can let, zoom into the image and just look around and say look at this look at that you know yeah, and it's that's like really an, cool. It's like an enhanced eyepiece view. Is that is what it is basically? Yes. And the people do that with EAA stuff, with uh, outreach and things with video cameras. But I, but if you've got your system set up for deep sky imaging, you can do the same thing. Yeah, but, for uh, outreach, I mean, they can. You know, I love it what people are doing with these projectors and stuff. You know, just hey, just project it on a big screen, and then everyone can look at it in one shot, right? And it's uh, really it makes it give everyone uh, excitement because everyone's con uh, enjoying that view at the same time. Right. Yeah.
You know, the, the changes in the cameras over the last five years, this is one of the reasons why the small telescopes are really kicking off at the moment. And it, it's what I've, I mean, some of the images we did of Mars, they were on a 102 millimeter telescope. You wouldn't have dreamed of doing that five years ago. You, no, you exactly. wouldn't have dreamed yeah. of doing it five years ago. You know, there was, it, it, you might have got a, a fuzzy image of it, but you certainly wouldn't have got detail or started to pick out Olympus Mons or things like that off a 102 mil scope. It's right. a combination of sort of optic changes and with the cameras. And the, by changing a camera now, you can zoom right in on something without having the bar load there or cutting down on the, the uh, magnification of the bar load. And as everybody knows, if you, you stick a five times in there, it's going to really darken up the image. You're going to have to up the exposure, and that's where everything right. starts going wrong. If you can remove that back down to a three times by changing the pixel size on the camera and having um, slightly uh, nicer optics in some of the cheaper telescopes, um, that's what's there. you know. And certainly from a UK point of view, I think we're selling a lot less um, Smith Cassegrains than what we were 10 years ago. 10 years ago, Smith Cassegrains were everywhere and everybody wanted one. Um, now everybody's after a refractor. Yes. The, the right. seeing conditions are just not allowing for uh, to make real good use of an SET in this day and age. Right. Yeah, software has come a long way too. That's a big part of yeah. it to be able to pull out every bit of data out of that. You know, I've, I've taken... 30 gigabytes of video doing lunar imaging in a session. And you can compile that down into, you know, five gigabytes for each movie and compile that down to one image. It's a lot of data. Yeah. I, I mean, like an average hour and a half session with the cameras we're using here probably be about 150 gigabyte. Yeah, that's a lot of data. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I could you know, probably. That, that's, um, that, that's an average sort of hour couple of hour sessions something like that you know normally have to keep an eye on where it's going because you have to start shifting it around if you're not careful certainly if you've left stuff on from the day before and right um, yeah exactly processed it. yeah so um but i think it also takes a lot longer i mean as we said the other day you know you used to get your images you'd have your images there by 12 o'clock and you'd be posting images up somewhere by sort of one o'clock up past one after running through them all the, the file sizes now are so big off of some of the cameras, it's taking it ages to process them. Even just to go through the video and check it for any errors before you start processing is taking forever now. So, um, but yeah, and that's why quite often a lot of the images don't get out till the next day. And I actually don't like that. I like to get a solar image out on the day that it's captured. That's the key thing. I never really won for putting them out, you know, a couple of days uh, after the event or whatever's occurred. So, um, but everybody's different on that. Um, it does get to a point though where you, you've got to sit down for a, uh, half a day and go through the hard drives and start removing SER files because they're, they're sort of dotted around in folders everywhere from um, thinking, oh, well, I'll keep that one or I'll have a look at that one later. And never getting around to going back to it and looking at it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you, did you hear Doug Struble earlier say he's got a uh, how, how many terabytes did he have? Eighty some or forty forty nine terabytes or forty eight terabytes. terabytes or something of storage yeah, some sort of yeah. on a NAS drive. Yeah, I, I can quite believe it. I mean. If we were doing all day imaging here, it, it would be nothing to hit, you know, two terabytes of data, easy. Yes. Um, and that's not recording fully, that's just grabbing things. Certainly if you go into doing uh, time-lapse on the sun, yeah, you're gonna grab a video every um, sort of 30 seconds to a minute, um, depending on how long you're gonna run that in a session. Uh, there's so much data there. And it's always also worth bearing in mind how much computers have changed over the last five years. I mean, five years ago, you'd struggle to get a laptop, unless you were going to spend really good money, a laptop to sit there and actually watch a video steady without pausing while it, loaded, it was still loading the video as it was playing. 
Mm-hmm. Whereas nowadays, you know, the, the average laptop, it fly through some of this stuff. You know, certainly with the advent of uh, solid state drives and things like that, they're making the, the capture as well. You know, we, we can start moving these cameras up, some of them here in like 500 frames a second. Mm. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that sounds ridiculous to say that, you, you know, you could record 30,000 frames in, you know, under a minute. You, you, you wouldn't dream of that five years ago. So the, the computer technology is helping us a lot as well. Right. Right. Uh, I was going to say that I think that uh, Pix Insights actually one of the better bang for the buck things out there for astrophotography, even though it's quite expensive without it. I mean, you know, you could replace any piece of gear with any other piece of gear to a point without stepping too low, but without Pix Insight, what it's capable of being so powerful. I mean, I don't know. That's kind of that's kind of the way I feel about Maxim DL. It's expensive software, but again, how much is your time worth? That's what I always look at. How much is your time worth? Is it in, is it worth the investment for a piece of software or a piece of technology? The biggest example I have is a telescope drive master. Not having to auto guide is a godsend. You know, you waste so much time with messing with your auto guiding system. It's just a pain. It's just a pain. Yeah, uh, I found that early on. I haven't the, had the too much trouble recently. The, but a I had lot, a lot of, of trouble starting. Has its, <laughs> has its uh, uh, little quirks and its little gimmicks and its little bits here and there. I mean, if I want to process something really, really fast, I need to look at the data and work out what's going on with it. I use AstroArt. AstroArt is the fastest piece of software on the planet. Yeah, it, it will, you know, rinse through uh, full frame images. Um, and they come back out in a fraction of the time. But then Pix Insights doing, doing it mathematically, so it's going to take time. You're going to get a better result out of the end of it. Um, so it, it's down to what people really want. But I think my attitude to it is if you spend over a thousand bucks on the equipment, then you should start looking at Pix Insight. Mm-hmm. A lot of people out there with thousands, thousands of dollars a gear and yeah. complain about the price of Pix Insight. And it's like, you know, not one of those high. things the gear that you spend that much money on is going to be that will for 300 bucks or whatever. Is. That people don't want to pay for software. We've, we've said that before on the shows, and I've always said it that astronomers are tight. Yeah, they, pay, they will pay for the equipment, and that's where the payment stops. <laughs> yeah, all of the software needs to come free after that. But see, this is no different to Photoshop. If you look how quick we put that time lapse video together you would be paying six hundred dollars or whatever you know a couple of thousand dollars a few years back for the whole adobe suite or whatever it was yeah and it couldn't do what this can do now um when we're doing mosaics the black area or the sky area yeah it will always be hard to match and because of the orientation of the moon or the sun there will be panels missing yeah in the in the sky area um, and to get those to match used to be a nightmare because you don't realize how many shades there are just in that one frame, yeah, across the image. So if you've got lots of these missing, to actually patch these all in, Photoshop does it all for you now. It can literally look at the whole image. And, you know, I'm on about big mosaics. I'm on 120 panel mosaics. It can yeah. look at that whole image, yeah, and work out every shade of the black that's missing and insert it for you. And then people are saying, oh, I don't want to pay $8 a month or whatever it is. For it. Yeah. Like, <laughs> okay, yeah, you want to go and fix that by yourself yeah. Yeah. somehow. Um, just, I mean, like if you look at all of the software for doing time-lapse, that was so easy to do that. It'd be worth $8 a month if you were doing oh, yeah. time-lapse videos. Sure. You know. um, well, if, you, so. if you're, you know, a lot of the amateur astronomers, I mean, in my mind, do professional level work, you know, and, and you want professional level tools for that too. So you've earned it. Yeah, but it's all sorts of things as well. It's color calibration, isn't it? Yep. You know, you, a lot of us use Adobe uh, 1998 for our color palettes, things mm-hmm. like that. So um, lots of these other programs actually strip the color out of your images. If they're free, 
they either can't render it or they, they take it away. So if you make a slight adjustment in that program, you lose all the color and you look at the image, you know, later and think, well, where did all the color go? Oh yeah, I adjusted the rotation very slightly in that other program. And it's, as soon as I did that and saved it, it stripped all the color out. Especially if you're using like a 16 bit camera and you're using an eight bit program to, you know, kick out your file when it's yeah. done. Um, so th there are a couple of programs out there that are, that are okay, but generally most of the free ones come with uh, some bugs somewhere along the lines that are going to drive you nuts. Um, but they're good starting points, you know. So Deep Sky Stacker is a good starting point for people to get used to stacking and the process of um, taking dark frames and uh all of those sorts of things and integrating them without spending any money and then deciding you know they want to go further so there is a place for some of the free software um it's just limited i'd still be using deep sky stacker all the time if it wasn't for they just didn't patch the cr3 files for canon fast enough when they came out and i bought pix insight never looked back well, you, but i mean you know, get, like, it was working great uh -huh. for me until i bought a new camera and it had a different uh raw file and they just didn't cover it at the time now they do that's right and, and you'll find that with adobe so if canon launched a camera tomorrow mm -hmm. yeah and it, it's out in the market and you, you you know you go to your favorite store and buy the camera and you get your raw files and you go to put them in a photoshop it goes nope can't see it and it won't see it until adobe pay canon yeah, for the Royal File license. It's been an ongoing thing for years and years and years. And it's all down to how long it takes for the money to transfer across. And that could be three months before you get that Royal File working. Once it's released normally into Photoshop, you generally find it goes into Deep Sky Stacker and the other pieces of software afterwards. But that, that's generally the, the tier structure with it. Um, and you find that those cameras are not going to work for, you know, you might as well say for a, a good couple of months after release. In my case, I think it was well over a year from the original release of CR3 files, because that yeah. would have been on the EOS R, I think. And I got a 90D last, about a year ago. Um, and the EOS R has been out for what, at least two years. And it didn't get find, patched um, till last, last fall. I mean, last um, spring at the earliest. But you used to find Deep Sky Stacker would have the newer version on its Yahoo group. And on its webpage, it'd have one that's about, you know, two years old or something. <laughs> so if you didn't know about the Yahoo group, Thanks you, for the heads you'd up. never find the, the raw driver for your camera to work in there. But Yeah. It's all part of the way it goes and, and how um, software goes. Cool. But anyway, I'm... Um, I'm going to take my leave now. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> I, I have a nod off. Yeah, guys, it's, um, it's uh, very late for Gary. Yeah. <laughs> very early. Um, yeah. Jerry's at uh, running about midnight 30 here. Cameron, thank you so much for being on with us and uh, showing us, uh, you know, all the uh, tips on smartphone astrophotography. And Richard, thanks for hanging in there with us all night long. And and yeah. uh, Gary, you too, man. So yeah, no worries. It's always a pleasure. It's a great, uh, great star party. And uh, for all of you in the audience that were watching, thank you so much. Um, uh, great audience. Um, I think that we. Um, it, it just, what was brought to the whole star party was so nice because it was, uh, uh, such a variety of things, you know, from, you know, uh, Daniel Barth with his, uh, uh, educational aspects to, you know, astronomy to teachers and, uh, um, you know, I, my head's just swimming right now thinking of all the different aspects of uh, astronomy that we covered tonight. So it was really, it was wonderful. Thank you very much, everyone, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, audience, Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, good night. Gentlemen, have yeah. a good night, everyone. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. So. Have a good one. All right. Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you.
It's time to say good night. We sincerely appreciate your patronage and hope we've succeeded in bringing you an enjoyable evening of entertainment. Please drive home carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Good night, everybody.